Uh, two things before we start. I, I want to, you know, this is not a usual meeting place, of course. I know Stephanie Venegas has worked very hard to set this up. Has anyone else worked with you, Stephanie, to do this? You were here at 7 a.m.? And Christopher? City TV. So I want to thank everybody who worked hard yesterday and early this morning to arrange for us to be here today. So let's give them a big hand, a round of applause. And then uh, a special appearance all the way from Folsom, California, <laughs> is our new police chief, Cynthia Renault. So let's give her a warm welcome. <laughs> this is sort of like a talk show, so we're going to run it like a talk show <laughs> with no commercial interruptions. Uh, so we'll now officially call this meeting to order. And since he's closest to the flag, Councilmember O'Day will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council Member. Um, normally we do an official roll call. Were you doing that, Esther? I will call roll. Council Member McKeown? Here. Councilmember Vasquez? Present. Councilmember Dvorich? Here. Mayor Winter? Here. Mayor Prince Davis? Here. Councilmember O'Day? Present. Councilmember Connick? Absent. All right. And with those formalities concluded, I want to welcome everybody here to the third uh, City Council retreat since Rick became our city manager. And I want to thank you for coming on this Saturday morning. You'll notice. In most of our meetings, I'll call it Mr. Cole, but when we have these sort of retreats, we dress casually and we refer to each other by first names. Uh, so that was hopefully set the tenor for this. It'll be a productive, casual meeting. Uh, I want to give a warm welcome to all the council members and the city department heads and strategic goal leads who are here today and to the members of the public who have chosen to join us this early. And I want to especially welcome Mark Keneal, our facilitator for today's roundtable discussion. Where is Mark? There's Mark back there. Let's learn a, little, learn a little bit about Mark. He's the managing partner of Innovative Resources Consultant Group, which is specializing in organizational change and leadership development, and is more than 30 years of practicing as a consultant and facilitator. He's worked nationally and internationally nationally with clients in government, higher education, private industry, and in entrepreneurial ventures. He's been working with the city of Santa Monica for more than 20 years, starting with the Big Blue Bus in 1996. He holds a degree from the College of William and Mary and is a certified arbitrator. And you'll notice that in the front row we have our city manager, assistant city manager, deputy city manager, department heads, strategic goal leads, and uh, senior subject matter experts here to be part of this discussion. And so we're going to take a different approach, as I mentioned earlier, a more informal approach. It's an opportunity for the city's elected and staff leaders to sit together for a roundtable discussion. Uh, our report will be in the form first of two videos that staff has prepared for what is a for what is 21st century government and the city's performance framework. That will give us all the broad overview of today's topics. Following those videos, we'll invite the public to provide input and comment, and the remainder of the time will be devoted to the facilitated discussion with Mark on 21st century government, government, the performance framework, and our strategic goals. So. Well, let's start with the video. Let's roll tape. <coughs> By pioneering the moving assembly line and mass-producing the Model T, the Ford Motor Company became an iconic automobile leader. Ford is still a successful company, and it's a global brand, yet it's still reforming legacy systems. So new ideas must work their way through more than 100 years of company inertia and the sentiment of, that's not how we've done it before. When Tesla came along almost exactly a century later, it too started from scratch, free not to function like a typical automobile company. Tesla's business model is built on the idea that mobility is not constrained by the way things have always been done. 
So it embraces innovation and develops new technology, and it's continuously seeking new ways to improve its systems and products. So how can we apply these lessons to government? Well, it's a different landscape now than 70 years ago when our city charter was adopted. Globally, the digital revolution has disrupted traditional industries. Nationally, a populist revolt has sprung from the erosion of trust in government, as well as the fiscal stress of public debt. Here in California, we're enduring a housing affordability crisis, and pension liabilities have put a real strain on municipal budgets. We're living in a digitally charged world that no longer accepts a 20th century style of work. It demands that we deliver government services that are designed for the 21st century. A 21st century government delivers successful outcomes instead of just providing services. It manages performance to achieve results instead of managing operations to achieve compliance. A 21st century government has a fluid structure that fosters cross-disciplinary teamwork and collaboration instead of just having a rigid chain of command. New staff are hired for talent, potential, and fit, not just based on experience and credentials. The model of government acting as a vending machine is finished. The 21st century government engages the community to set shared priorities and seek collaborative solutions. So how can Santa Monica meet this challenge? While we continue to deliver high-quality performance, Santa Monica must be quicker and more agile at responding to our changing community. We need to be focused more on results and less on process. We need to be willing to innovate, to experiment, and pilot new ways of accomplishing our goals. As the hub of Silicon Beach, Santa Monica should be savvy about using technology to save time and money and deliver better results. We must be mobile and provide 24-7 digital services to our entire community. Santa Monica can harness data to make better decisions. Drilling down on data enables us to anticipate trends and to be transparent about our results. One of our greatest assets in Santa Monica is our talented workforce. By investing in training and development, we can empower our staff to be more nimble and more responsive. Santa Monica needs to realize we're not an island and we're not a monopoly. Our citizens compare us not to other cities like Los Angeles or West Hollywood, but to their experiences with businesses they use every day, like Apple or Amazon or even Tesla. So what is Santa Monica doing now? Well, we've established a citywide framework that focuses on measurable outcomes to enhance community sustainability and well-being. The council adopted specific strategic goals, and we've made real progress toward achieving them. We're implementing a performance management system across the board called SAMOSTAT, which focuses on quickly moving the needle on the results that matter most to our residents. We've launched the total workplace effort to make our workforce more mobile, our workspaces more flexible, and our work more collaborative. We've mapped out our digital strategy to revamp our online presence and digitize all of our services. We're deploying expanded outreach efforts that nurture community relationships and encourage two-way dialogue. Our city departments are pursuing new approaches to enhance communication and service delivery, to build stronger community partnerships, to foster civic engagement and policy innovation. All of these are moving us closer to delivering 21st century government to all our residents, but there's much more that we can do. So how will we know if we're successful? Well, we'll know we're successful if we've raised community trust and raise satisfaction in government. We'll know we're successful if we establish clear outcomes that are measured and reported on transparently, and they produce better results with more efficiency. We'll know we're successful if we maintain our fiscal health against all the looming threats, the leveling out of traditional revenues in a changing economy, our growing personnel and pension costs, the likelihood of a future recession, as well as the potential for federal and state cutbacks. We'll know we're successful if we achieve higher job satisfaction in our workforce and a better balance between expectations and capacity, so we're doing more of what works and less of what doesn't. 
Ultimately, we'll know this model is working when Santa Monica community members see themselves as active participants in their government and not just taxpayers and consumers, that they see they're part of the solution and that their contributions make a difference. Together, we can work toward this 21st century model of government. We can deliver on our commitment to achieve a thriving, sustainable city of well-being, a city that works for everyone. So here are a few questions that can help lead us into our discussion today. What are the hallmarks Santa Monica should strive for in building a 21st century government? And how are we progressing toward this new model? And finally, most importantly for today, what is City Council's role? And what's the role for citizens through our boards and commissions? Now that we've shared the vision of what a 21st century government looks like, we'd like to present the framework we've designed to help bring the vision of a 21st century government to life. This includes defining the pressing outcomes we strive to achieve for our community, how we organize and structure the city's work, measure the outcomes that deliver the 21st century government services, and use data to inform our decision making. Our hope is that this video weaves the tapestry of how the framework, strategic goals, and SAMO stat fit together. Santa Monica is a city that is committed to sustainability and community well-being. Our policies and service delivery are built around these values and grounded on a foundation of good governance. To ensure we remain focused on the things that matter the most, we're using data to inform our work, connect our purpose with function, and measure outcome areas that deliver 21st century government services. The framework is a system we've developed that helps us organize our efforts and collectively drive towards meaningful results. It was designed based on the research and structure of the Wellbeing Index and the Sustainable City Plan. The Wellbeing Index is a new measurement tool that combines a variety of traditional and non-traditional data sources to give us a baseline understanding of community well-being. The Sustainable City Plan ensures that the city continues to meet current environmental, economic, and social needs without compromising the ability of future generations to do the same. Concepts gleaned from the Wellbeing Index and the Sustainable City Plan shaped six major outcome areas to organize and measure our work. Community, place and planet, learning, health, economic opportunity, and governance. Each of these outcome areas contribute to the sustainability and well-being of our community. We further identified sub-outcome areas that help us categorize key efforts. Community. How strong is the sense of connection and community in the city of Santa Monica? Safe community. Connected community. Engaged community. Learning. Do people have the opportunity to enrich their knowledge and skill sets across their lifespan and participate in well-being enhancing activities? Early childhood through middle school learners, high school through young adult learners, adult learners. Place and planet. Does the city's physical and social environment promote and support sustainability and well-being? Ecosystems. Built environment. Infrastructure. Health. How healthy is the city of Santa Monica? Environmental health. Physical health. Mental health. Economic opportunity. How can the economy meet the basic needs of residents in the city of Santa Monica? Affordability. Inclusive economy. Business diversity. Governance. How can we govern in a way that inspires trust and confidence from the public? Stability, transparency, equitability, effective and efficient business processes. How do we measure our work in these outcome areas? The city designed a performance management program called SAMOSTAT, which monitors progress in outcome areas by looking at metrics that drive us towards reaching goals. This program is designed around four tenets. Know what's happening by looking at accurate and timely data. Create effective tactics. Design work plans that take quick action. Do more of what works and less of what doesn't. To launch SAMOSTAT, we began by measuring work progress around the five strategic goal areas 
Council identified in 2015. Mobility, learn and thrive, inclusive and diverse community, homelessness, and the future of the Santa Monica Airport. Action plans outline specific programs and projects assembled for each goal area and connected to sub-outcome areas that the work would impact. We closely monitor and report on progress in each outcome area based on the effectiveness of the work being done. Over time, we will continue to refine our framework in SAMOSTAT. We will grow the inventory of programs and projects monitored in the system. Soon, we will have an online dashboard so the public can see data and watch the work progress. Together, we can use this information to better understand the impact of our work and make meaningful changes in our community to help us thrive. Here are a few questions that can lead us in our discussion today. Should safer community be identified as its own outcome area? How can we build on data and experience? What does moving to a single framework mean for the sustainable city plan and other individual efforts? How can we effectively measure and demonstrate progress? All right. I think our next step this morning is that Katie, our assistancy manager, is going to have some discussion. That's what it says on my notes. No. Um, or am I, I misunderstanding? I think that we uh, moved past that. Now we're okay. In the <laughs> All right. Well, I guess your, co your input was the video. <laughs> well done, then. So in that case, we're here for the public, and we have some speaker chits. And we will, where is the microphone for the public? Right over here at this podium. We will hear first from Denise Barton, then um, Larry is donating two minutes to Anthony Wall, if I read this correctly. Larry here, there's Larry. Welcome, Denise. Good morning. I don't think this is on. I don't think this is on. Excuse me. Someone turn on the mic at the podium. I don't have the controls. Good morning. Good morning. The staff, re the staff report is quite interesting, especially because the city has a new accounting method, as well as hiring requirements for city staff, which is no longer based on experience and ability but how easy the employee is able to be brainwashed to the low standards of the city of Santa Monica. The staff report is also very short on specifics. So since that is the case, I'll touch on a situation that will and, pres and, is and presently is having a negative effect on the health, safety, and welfare of the city of Santa Monica and its residents. Due to the low standards, greed, and corruption by all of you sitting up there in your city staff. Let's look at the Geary Building and the Miramar Hotel, because I think the monstrosities of these projects will be detrimental due to adding significant additional weight to an already unstable bluff. To support my position, I encourage you to look at the independent FEMA appeal analysis dated June 6, 2001, titled Palisades Bluff Landside, where the appeal analysis clearly states in the conclusion, two, that there is clearly substantial evidence that where the slide was precipitated by the storm, <coughs> It is the result of an inherent weakness of the geological formation and that the slide is part of the natural process of erosion, which is an ongoing phenomenon over the entire length of the bluffs. And three, that the work performed on the bluffs was permanent stabilization and not emerging proactive measures. In light of the above findings, the appeal is denied. So with this information, I would say your sources of economic funding, the AKA the Geary Building and the Miramar Hotel, in their proposed construction will more than likely be detrimental to the plus stability. And wh what if the bluff slides to second or further east as a result of the negligent action of approval of these projects? And what kind of liability will the city hold as a result of the people hurt or killed by it? Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Ann. Ann Thanawala, mom and act activist unpaid here in Santa Monica. Um, you know, the well-being survey, the money by design came from Bloomberg, 
which was instrumental and in, uh, flowed through the men of Davos, the billionaires in Switzerland. That's where that money came from. That discussion of kind of putting us all together in a framework that continues to elevate the 1% and keep the rest down. And then we moved into this framework with the RAND Corporation, who, as we all know, serves the military industrial complex. And I'm really concerned, I think, as a number of our community members are, about how this city is moving forward with these <coughs> ideas. Um, the idea of merging uh, corporations with our government actually s undermines the authority of the public to be involved, to put another layer between the public and the democratic process. So when you're collecting this data, how it's shared, how it's stored, are you monetizing <coughs> the citizenry? Are you digitizing the citizenry? I believe this is a, an issue that everybody should be looking at. I think we're all concerned about it. And I don't see any of that in this discussion. Um, who, who are you working for? What are your goals as, as city council members, as staff? Um, are you looking at the fact that you're falling into a matrix to continue to propel the same problems that we've historically had throughout the history of mankind? Um, the, the issue of the, the uh, targets that you're looking at, you're looking at a lot of soft targets in the points that were made here. Um, soft targets that can't actually relate into um, proficiencies for staff uh, because they ca you, can't, you can't put a value on talent. You can't um, evaluate talent. What does talent look like? Who determines, though, what talent is? Um, the other night at the meeting with the Compensation Oversight Committee and the Audit Committee, um, the public was again told and compared city staff uh, um, salaries to those of, you know, working in uh, the high end in corporations. Yet today, we're being shown something quite different that we don't need to be looking at that. We need to be looking at talent and, and how, do you, how do you choose talent when you're not choosing from people who are coming from backgrounds that have higher education? So it's very confusing how you put those numbers together and then still say it all works. So um, the issues I want to hear addressed today are the issues that I spoke about of hierarchy the 1% continuing to perpetuate the situation, and the privacy. <coughs> How are you, what are you doing to, to gain control of the public's data? Is it going to be centralized? Who's storing it? How is it going to be controlled? Who are you sharing it with? All of the corporations that you contract with, third parties, also share, and when they sell the corporations, they sell your data with it. So please address those, thank you. Thank you, and that concludes the public input. And now I believe we'll turn to Mark to facilitate the rest of this discussion. Is that correct? I don't know where he's going to do it from. Here. I know. I don't. I'm just wondering where you're going to do it from. I'm going to do it from over here, so I okay. can see everybody here. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we're going to go through an exercise first to kind of get us framed around the subject. And then from there, we're going to get into some discussion. Uh, so what you'll notice is you've got some post-its uh, in front of you. Uh, and there's some pens there. And I'm basically going to ask you a few questions. And I want you to sit uh, comfortably in your chair and answer those questions. And you can use as many post-its as you want to answer those questions. If you run out of pads, I have more. Uh, so we can do more. And, uh, and when you finish filling out those post-its uh, and we get through the series of questions we're going to get through, I'm going to ask each of you to get out of that comfortable chair you're in 
And uh, I've got a wall display up here that's uh, behind uh, some uh, butcher paper right now. I'm going to ask you to go put those up there. And uh, the reason I want you to go put those up there is because we have department heads here, and we have leads here, and we have council here, and we want to get the different views on, on the board here so that that can begin our discussion point. Are we connected? Are we seeing things the same? Are we seeing things very different? Uh, what's the view on it, okay? So if you're on a journey, and the journey is going from the 20th century government to the 21st century government, and that's what I hear, okay? Um, the first question I want to ask you is, what is the city currently doing well? Because one of the worst things you do in a journey is break what's going really well. So what, from your perspective, is the city really doing well. Any of the public that's here, if you would like a pad, a post, I'm more than happy to hand it out to you as well, because we'd love to have your input as well. Is it one per post-it, or can we put more than one idea on a post-it? Say again? So, in other one, words... One thought per post-it, please. Yeah, one thought per post-it. So on this one, what does the city do well? And again, if it's very simple and you want to put two on one, that's okay. We're going to transcribe that. Uh, once I take it out of this room, I'm going to transcribe what you put down. So uh, again, that's why I don't want too many on one particular post-it. They asked me to step over to this side of the room, so that's why I'm over here. What does the city do, does well? Uh -huh. yep, yep. I got more if you need them. on your post that you have number one on it. You have a number one. So when you go to put it on the board, we don't get the wrong one in the wrong place, okay? The second question, the second question I would like you to add, answer is on this journey, what potholes or detours are we going to encounter? So we're going from the 20th century to the 21st century. What potholes, okay, or detours might we be occurring? And if I could wait, make one edit for those in the public that are using Post-its, if you could please put P on you, each of yours so that I can make sure I capture yours as a group. Okay, I would appreciate it. So please put P on each of your post-its. That's all I need is a P on it, please. First question was, what do we do well as a city? The second question is, what potholes or detours are we likely to occur or are occurring that uh, could cause us to get off course or drop in a hole? And I might add that the reason I used potholes is it could be one where they're driving with a truck and they use one shovel of asphalt and put in it, or it could be the size of a sinkhole. So be aware.
second question is what potholes or detours are likely to occur going from this 20th century government to this 21st century government? And that could be current or it could be future. And you mean not figuratively, not literally, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. I hope so. Pothole at 24th in Georgia. Thank you for that input, okay. Third question. Third question, and this is a three-part question. In your view, what is council's role? That's A. What is the department's role? Department's in the city. What's their role? That's B. And C, what's the city manager's office role? Council's role, department's role, city manager's office role. A, B, and C. <coughs> However you feel, it could be in general, it could be very specific, depending on, that's why we're trying to get everybody's view on it. Sure. Uh, A is council's role, B is department's role, and C is city manager's office role. back and reframing the first question was what are we currently doing well as a city question two what potholes or detours are we likely to come across and then question three what are the roles a is council's role B is uh, the department's role and C is the city manager's office's role Uh, I'm going to have you put it on a specific place on the board, uh, and as long as you put it on there, then before I roll it, I'll be taping it all to it, uh, so it, it'll hold. It, it, you just need to do it so you know which one's which question, um, so that you get it in the right place. And again, if you're, if you're adding on your post-it and you're from the public, if you could please make sure you just put a P on each page. That way we know it is a public input and we want to be able to capture that as a grouping. Next question. If we need more time, you got it. You got it. I'm not on a two minute rule. You got it. What are the roles? What's council's role? What is the department's role? And the third is, what is the city manager's office role? Ready for the last question? All right, we arrive at 21st century government. And you saw in the video what that perspective was of what it looks like. In your world, what does success look like if we achieve this 21st century government? What does success look like in your world to arrive at the 21st century government?
Anybody trying to catch up? I'll go back. The first question was, what are we currently doing well as a city? The second question was, what potholes or detours are we likely to incur or are going to possibly we should be looking for? The third was an ABC, what are the roles? What is council's role? What is the department's role? And the third was, what is the city manager's office role? And then this last question that you should be answering now, when we arrive, when we're, when we're getting close, what does success look like? From your perspective. And when you're comfortable, you've answered all those questions, you're more than welcome to take and bring them over to the board. And put them on the appropriate place up on the board. Be careful around the speaker when you put your success up. Uh, the speaker happens to be right in front of it. Is that, is that an okay way to clarify with a P on it? That way, yeah. that, I want that input. That input is good. It's good input. It's interfering with something over there. And as you finish putting your post-its on the board, if you would take your seat, Which that would I, be great. I saw that you had commented that, 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 that you're we're losing a lot of our Yes, we are. So to me, is that a big, a, but some a bigger of conversation yeah. of what can we do that's, that's as a city that's true. to have that's just what I keep but what can you do about right. what can you do about when people turn 73 and are just ready to retire? He didn't want to retire. Yet. So why did you say that in the press? He was making it nice. Of the ordinary people and bring in a bunch of new The narrative is that the city isn't supporting. 
supporting a lot of the mom and pop and the making and doing something to help them what do you stay. Think they could do? I have a couple ideas. I really do. And I'm working on moving the preservation up to be more important. That's exactly what I talked about. And so we are looking at supporting homes and homelessness and all that. But supporting our so I am this I live this issue. And that's the reason we are hard for us. And so anyhow, but I wanted to make sure there's no negative and I never blame the city. I support the city. But but just be aware that what's what I am aware of all the negative if you would take your seat.
Okay, folks, take your seat, please. We're ready to reconvene. observations. Uh, observation one is we needed more space, yes. uh, but it, we're restricted by the room, so that's the, I apologize for that. But it, it's interesting to me, take a look at potholes. It's kind of full. <laughs> take a look over at success. We could put a few more. It's just interesting to me where the human uh, mind kind of goes. Uh, uh, I, I like the idea, if you look to the far, far left, what are we currently doing well? Uh, I would, again, I haven't read any of them, but my suspicion is there's a whole bunch that we do well that we need to make sure we keep doing well. Um, that's my suspicion. And the other thing I find interesting is if you come over to the far right, what does success look like? It will be very interesting once my office gets that and starts typing it down, how narrow or how wide that answer is. Because if you look at, when you're answering those questions, I mean, it came up to me and they said, they liked those questions, okay? I asked those questions for a very specific purpose. I wanna see if we have 100 people here in the room, I wanna see if 100 people just have the same view of something and they see it just slightly different or whether I have 100 views of it which then it becomes a real challenge to try to achieve. So when we look at that success, it's gonna be fascinating to share back to you to say, this is what success looks like, or this is what success looks like. Because that will determine, okay, where your starting point is from my perspective as a change specialist, it determines where your starting point is in managing towards that objective. Let's talk a little bit about it. Let's talk about some of the things that we're, and we're gonna go piece by piece by piece. First of all, we're on this journey. Uh, we do a lot of things well. What are some of the things we do well? Do you want it from us? I want it from whoever. Uh, what, what are some of the things we do well? Spend money. <laughs> Spend money? Okay. That's finally, yeah, let's raise hands. Okay, good. So uh, the first thing I put was basic services because I have to say in all the mail I get, I rarely get complaints about trash and uh, streets and, and things like that. So I think that we do do the basic services really well, the parks, etc. Okay, good. Well, I think we also, and we do spend money, but we spend money on important things. We not only do provide the basic services that most cities provide, but we also give millions of dollars to our schools. We support lots of programs for the youth in our community. We're one of the few cities that actually give grants to arts and the artists and provide support for local nonprofits. So I think not only do we do the basic stuff, but we actually are on um, what I like to think of as the leading edge of uh, budgeting in a way that reflects our community's values, which is support for the arts, education, uh, making sure that people have the opportunity to thrive in our community. Is that a hand back there? Yes. yes. Uh, I appreciate the way our city fields and parks are maintained. I just think we need more of them. Okay. Yep. Um, I appreciate the community involvement, sessions like this, and the appointment of really significant boards and commissions that are open to public hearings and well attended. I'm very appreciative. Okay. 
Yes. I'm very proud of the breadth and depth of human services that we provide to people in our community. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Our libraries are really well maintained and have incredible programming. Um, I think we have one of the best library systems in our city. Um, in Los Angeles County, so good. I appreciate it. Okay, good, 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 good. How about up here? I'm not hearing anything out of this row here. I heard this row, I'm hearing that row. This row is quiet. Come on, talk to me. So I put police in fire. I actually think they do a fantastic job. I think that there are a lot of challenges today. I think that uh, we have nimbleness problems and, uh, and we have um, uh, sort of coverage problems, but I uh, rarely hear complaints <coughs> about police and fire. All right. okay. I think we have incredibly dedicated staff. Um, I think that they are really working hard on behalf of the community and really have the community's best interest at heart. Okay, good, good, yep. I didn't mention that I really well maintain some parks. I couldn't help but look out the window and see the activity and what's going on here today and just and I marvel at how okay. amazing. Something other than spend money? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. I think the city's showing a great deal of improvement. They have hired Rick Cole, and Rick Cole is hiring a wonderful team, and they've made great strides since Rick was speaking. I think that indicates that there is very good attitude towards growth. Okay, good. Good, thank you. Yep. I think we're a national model for sustainable cities and a global leader in this area. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I think they're doing a great job here at the park with its programs and engaging kids, families, parents. And, and so I feel like we went from a park where parents wouldn't allow their kids to come here many years ago. And actually, you know, city council, this wouldn't even be happening here to what's now happening at the park. I feel like it could be a model for other areas in the city that are experiencing crime whatnot. Okay, all right. Yep. I think the city support of the uh, of the employees. Um, I've been in a couple other cities uh, for the fire department. They, they don't have a, a full fire academy. The SMI for the new hire orientation, it's a lot more than mm -hmm. a lot of cities do. So when people get hired here, they have an opportunity to be successful. Okay, good. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I guess two big things for me. When I first got elected in 1990, one of the biggest criticisms I got was that uh, we're in the Pico neighborhood here. We're dumping everything in the Pico neighborhood, especially affordable housing. And that was a real big, uh, real big challenge for us because land costs is just so expensive. But I think over the last 20 some years, maybe longer now, uh, we've done a good job of spreading out affordable housing throughout the city. So now we have actually a pretty good mix of low income folks living all over the city. Okay. And then along the police and fire, um, Back in the 90s, too, I think our police force and our fire department was a totally different animal. Uh, I think we, uh, I don't think we had any women on the fire department back then. And, and then uh, and on the police side, we had very few people that actually grew up in the neighborhood. Now we have quite a bit of officers that actually not only grew up here in Santa Monica, you know, obviously know the neighborhood, but it's made a huge difference in terms of community policing. Thank you. Yes. I think we do a lot of um, the invisible things very well, um, like our infrastructure, um, our financial management, our, our people management. I think those kinds of things enable the things that are visible to go well. And I think it's the foundation for what we do. Okay. How about this row here? Anybody? Yes. Okay. I think on the side of staff, we take a very comprehensive view to understand it. If we develop a program, it's not a one-off. We actually think pretty comprehensively about all the different impacts that it has and okay. try to focus on those as well. Okay, all right, good. Yes. I agree with all the comments that have been said, but I want to add that I think our city government collaborates very well with the other two major governmental institutions, <coughs> Santa Monica Mountain Union High School District and Santa Monica College. And those three institutions are such uh, important infrastructure for our whole community and the fact that they all talk to each other and look for ways to um, collaborate is a very positive thing for all, the whole community. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I wanted to thank you to each of the members of the city council. 
wonderful because they are, I, I believe that they are doing a very good job. They are in house. Uh, they are embracing the diversity, which is very important. So I see how they, uh, what they are saying to the community. Uh, is, I, I, I can testify from that. And um, I have children in our school, so they are doing what they do. Uh, also, they are providing activities for the family and, and the diversity groups. It's not just one thing is different, different. So I, I really appreciate that. Good. Good. Okay, thank you. Are we going? Okay. I also think that we do customer service really well. That's not something that we think of often. Can you hear back there? Oh, I'm sorry. I think we do customer service very well. We look at all of the services that we provide through the experience of our community, and that's different as opposed to just putting out services and and programs without necessarily considering that. So I do think we look at the customer a lot. Okay, all right. Everyone? Yep. Yeah, I want to add to that because I find everyone I call at City Hall really helpful. And I built a house and I actually like the building department. I know people. But they just slap it for you over there. <laughs> That's a, that's a bigger smile than I've seen on David in years, okay? <laughs> Look how council just loosened up when you said that, okay? Things change suddenly in the room. Okay, we should good. have more Saturday meetings. <laughs> good deal. Yes, ma'am. I think arts and culture uh, has been doing an amazing job. Shannon Dodd and that department have uh, the diversity of their programming and tackling so many different issues from literature to theater, it's amazing. <coughs> I think we show an extraordinary degree of com compassion as a government and as a community for uh, the most vulnerable or the least well off, especially um, our homeless residents. Okay. It, it. I think we take very innovative approaches to uh, project planning and, and uh, project management and implementation once we identify the path. Okay. Yeah. I think we take advantage of grant opportunities and other ways to bring other funding to the community for special initiatives and things we want to accomplish. Okay. okay. Other comments on that one? Let's move on to uh, the, one of the favorite categories back there, uh, potholes and detours. Um, and uh, maybe we'll start off up here with what you see from your perspective. I'm looking at those two, and then we'll involve the public after we get a little bit of dialogue here. But w what do we see as the potholes and detours? Yes. So I. Either. either. Oh, yeah. Well, I have a couple. So I think one of them is a fear of failure that we don't let people, our staff, know that we want them to try innovative things, recognizing that occasionally they may not work out. Um, I think that everyone's so focused on if it fails, there'll be repercussions. I think, too, is uh, we need to focus less on politics and more on the greater good, if that makes sense. I think that it's important that we rely on our staff to be our expert advisors. Um, we as a council, as politicians, have to deal with the politics and recognize that. But I think what we want from staff is, is impartial expert advice, and we don't you know, expect or need them to shade or color their advice with politics because I think that that gets in the way of getting the best advice. Um, sometimes the right thing is not always the popular thing and it's not staff's duty to try and choose between the two. Unfortunately, for better or for worse, that falls on us. And then I think the other thing is we need to empower our staff more so we can be more agile on a going forward basis. I think if 14 different people have to approve things, and some of this comes from the fear of failure, then it takes a long time to get anything done. But if we empower staff to say, I got a great idea, let's go with it, understanding if it doesn't work out that there's not going to be hand wringing and keening and wailing, then I think our staff is better able to deal with things like good customer service and things like that. They can take care of problems without having to escalate it, you know, and wait for the next council meeting where there's room on the agenda. Okay. Yeah. So actually, I put Gleam's notion on the role of department heads, but I see the same thing is that we need to be less afraid to take risks, less afraid of failure. Um, let's try stuff. If it doesn't work, not a big deal. Uh, in terms of other challenges we have ahead of us, I think that um, 
clearly, as we've discussed already, uh, our fiscal health poses problems in the long run through the changes through technology and other advances, which may reduce our retail sales tax, uh, may reduce our parking revenues, et cetera, unstable future. This is all noted earlier, but I, I think that's something we always need to bear in mind. We have the pension debts that are alluded to, so we have to continue to look to keep our economy vibrant and keep the source of the funds that provides all those services uh, thriving. Um, I think the other big challenge we have uh, going forward is we live in a world where there's so much media noise out there. For us to be able to communicate with our constituents is increasingly challenging, and I know we're working on that, but I think that's something we still have a lot more uh, potential success ahead of us. We need to be able to cut through the chatter and find an efficient and elegant means to let our community know what's going on out there. I, I get emails about stuff that people say, this is, you guys, there was one a couple months ago, this guy posted on next door that that night we were going to close the 4th Street off ramps from the freeway. I'm like, where does that come from? <laughs> We might do a lot of dumb things sometimes at City Council, <laughs> but it's not even our freeway off ramp. <laughs> it's Caltrans. But somehow we've got to get through all that noise out there, and, and that breeds the distrust that we have to overcome, right? The, the idea that somehow we're going to do this stuff that because we're, you know, don't have the public's best interest at heart. And I know everybody on this council does have the public's be best interest at heart, so somehow we've got to make sure people understand that better. Okay. I want to follow up on Ted's second point because one of the fundamental underpinnings of successful community is communication. And public mistrust is all too easy to create with false information. We, one of the externalities that we face going forward is the fragmentation of the public dialogue. It used to be you had certain news sources that you could turn to and trust. And now with social media and online dialogue, often unattributed to any real person or real name, there is information being circulated either out of fundamental misinformation, ignorance, or sometimes even maliciously that undermines the ability of this community to decide what we all want and to pull together to accomplish it. Now, we can, from the city end, work on that to the extent that we can try to get accurate information out there I think we also need to figure a way to involve our community in becoming more discerning about the information that they either are hearing or even worse, passing on without verifying. I think maybe we could make it easier for people to verify what is and what isn't. Because if something comes out on Saturday morning in social media and there's nobody at City Hall to answer the question until Monday morning, uh, as they say, you know, a rumor will be around the world before the truth puts its pants on. Who said that? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one, though. Yeah. So, that's a very good one. So, <laughs> Make so, it so. so I am hearing this common theme of fear of failure, which was something that I put up, and I think it happens on both ends. I think that staff worries that, uh, that we won't support them in what they're doing, and we worry staff won't support us in what we're doing. And I agree with everybody that it's almost a failure of communication because if we were talking to each other more and having more open dialogue, then everybody would know where everybody stands, right? Now, we can't do that because of the Brown Act, but we can do it with staff. And, uh, and I think we probably ought to do it more. Um, I think we need to be more agile. We need to be more open to change, to changing systems, to changing structures. Um, I've long thought this. I mean, I think that things are happening so fast, not only in a media sense, but in a world sense, that um, the change is happening faster than we might be able to get a staff report, go out to planning commission, go out to council, et cetera. So I think that we may want to take smaller bites of the apple, maybe. I mean, and, and this goes to the final thing, but that we're trying to do everything big and maybe that's making everybody so afraid, the idea of commitment, and we're used to thinking of things in a traditional way of we commit to this path, and this is a path we're on. And I think that we're sort of in that um, bullet train mode of you have to have the bullet train. Well, maybe not. So um, I think we need to think of the world more like that. Okay. All right. 
Maybe move on to this row here first. I'm going to come to that row third. Maybe this row here. Thoughts, potholes, detours? And uh, losing sight of our top goals and priorities because we're going to do everything. Okay. Everybody hear that? Did you hear back there? Losing no. sight of uh, what the priorities might be because we're trying to do everything. <clears throat> Care? Bringing all staff along on the journey. Mm -hmm. There's a novel concept, huh? Uh, just to follow up on Andy's, it's alignment of priorities um, within the departments and within and, and with the council, um, and sticking to those priorities once we all agree on that alignment. I think when the mayor introduced me, he said I've been around the city for a long time working as a consultant, and I will tell you, based on the comments that a couple of people said here, there's a lot of staff it, that work in the city that are stressed out over the amount of stuff on their plate right now, a lot. More so than I've seen in years and years. Uh, and and it's, it's just interesting to see the load that people are feeling. And it's just not department hits, you, it's individual contributors as well, as well. You can feel that load that's out there. Right or wrong, I'm not taking a position on it. It's just, it's a load. What I always tell people is city government used to be, back when I started consulting, it used to be about a 0.7 ratio, meaning for every job, uh, basically you had about a 0.7 fill, so you had more people than you have now. Now government is about a 1.2, 1.3 fill, meaning you have about 1.3 jobs for every person that's there, and that's where that prioritization really uh, takes hold, and you've got to really be aware of it. So along with um, staying within the priorities is learning when to let go of something. Here. When to let go of things. I think that means stop doing some things. <laughs> another way to put it in Mark's world. That's it. Um, I think it's a challenge. We need to start looking at changing some of our personnel practices that have been in place for years and years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in particular, like civil service system. Okay. okay. I think the challenge of sort of make sure you're speaking up in this row so everybody can hear. The challenge of public-private partnership. I mean, it seems clear that to move into the 21st century, it involves bringing in uh, the other players that have very different operating assumptions and business practices, and how we as a city can figure out how to pivot a little to align with those. Okay. Other thoughts in this row? We'll move back here now. Yes, ma'am. Like, yeah, I, 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 uh, I think you all work really hard in policing on that, but clearly there's a crime issue that's been escalating, at least in my neighborhood. So I know that's a, probably a big challenge for me. Yes, sir. I think a lack of con you know, a concern should be the lack of back and forth communication between residents and city council members. And I would re recommend pursuing a electronic town hall meeting where uh, residents can ask and get follow-up questions and communicate better with uh, city council members. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, okay, I'm just going to use this forum today as, as like the issue. Um, I don't know how many people, members of the public, were aware of this and that this thing was going to happen and that something was going to balloon out of this and some statistics were going to come back and I'm, you know, concerned that there might be a lot more people who would like to have participated in that that aren't here to speak for themselves today. So, um, you know, when it comes to any issue that a, 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 a member of the public is interested in, um, and is clearly following, and and there's a lapse of communication where the public then can't follow it, and what they're advocating for um, gets dumped, basically because they're not there to advocate for it. Um, those kinds of that kind of communication between staff or maybe even the council at times um, needs to happen. And it's not happening. The, the, the good news is, is communications has been an issue for hundreds of years. That's why I've made a living at it for 40 years. 
okay? Um, and it just matters of who I have in the room, whether it's the public and council, or whether it's an employee and their manager, or whether it's this and this. Uh, communications are always an issue. And you know how you improve communications? By doing more bad communications. That's typically how organizations improve communications. Because they say, we currently do this, so if we just do more of that, people will be informed. And the reality of it is, is they're not, because it's missing it. So communications is always going to be a challenge. And then let's bring in the, the different uh, 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 demographics that you deal with here in Santa Monica. And let's also bring in the generational differences that are now coming in, uh, that basically how they receive information. The communications issue is not getting easier to work on. It's getting Mark's view, okay, and one thing you'll never find is me facilitate a session without giving you Mark's view. It's going to get harder, and it's going to get harder as you go forward. So what I would say to you is, I think your cause is right, but I also think you have to think about solutions and making some recommendations, because if council just does what, more of what they're already doing, then the public doesn't know what they need to know. So it's, it, it's an expansive type thing that's got to occur. And sessions like this where you get the dialogue, you, you learn to appreciate the differences of, of, of what's going on. And I, the good news is, is before I put my head down and call it a day and retire, communications will still be an issue. Because it's, it's the number one issue you see in government, number one issue you see in industry, not in nonprofit, in higher education. It, it, it's, I, I can write the top five things that are in every organization, and communications is always in the number one or number two slot. It just sits there. I didn't mean to go on a lecture there, but I have to at some time during the day. I have to. There you go. Yes, yes ma'am. I just wanted to follow up because I do think that, you know, uh, the essence of these kinds of events is uh, community participation and resident engagement. And so, Part of what you're saying, I mean, the fact is that there's some common sense, right? If you, if the council is interested in genuinely uh, engaging the community, then there, you know, the fact that you having this meeting on the same day as a neighborhood council, where you have leaders of all of the neighborhoods meeting, and it's at the same day at the same time. The other thing is that the neighborhood association, the Pico Neighborhood Association, wasn't even uh, notified that this was happening. And so we have members that we could have engaged. And so there's, there's an issue of, uh, of uh, being genuine, right, with these important issues, right, that are going to be discussed. And so I think that that's something that should be noted, right? And I hope that this isn't the only time that the public are, is going to have an opportunity to engage. I, I hope that this is not the time that what comes out of this automatically shifts to some other outcome because that it's a problem, you know, because there's an issue of being genuine and engaging and listening to the residents and not just a data-driven decision. But these decisions that affect our cities need to come from uh, residents genuinely working together with a council. Thank you. And, I, and again, I, sometimes I, I say too much, but I'll say it. Part of data is also public input. Okay, uh, data is not just data. Y your definition of data might be too narrow. Public input, I don't know. I haven't seen the same stat specifics of data, but in a city, it's going to include some sort of public, I would think it would, would be part of the data that's going to be captured. Makes sense to me. Yes, ma'am. Yes, talking about the issue of solutions and to approach this from a solution standpoint, uh, yesterday, uh, we launched Living Room Conversations, and we are doing, we launched uh, National Week of Conversations. So I think Santa Monica is hosting the biggest uh, conversation so far, and that's good. Um, but I think we have to keep this type of event at least once a month. We cannot just do it once every blue moon. So, and then do smaller uh, weekly events. Uh, so the framework of the living room conversation actually facilitates to be in a room with people that disagree with you. And it's not about debating the issues, it's not about being right or wrong, it's about listening to each other. The hashtag is listen first to argue better. 
Uh, there's a lot of non-for-profits uh, that are doing this work around the country. I think this particular community is very polarized. Uh, everybody wants their democracy their own way and serve it you know, with ketchup or mayonnaise or pickles. And I think it's time that we really come together and we grow up and be able to be in a room with people that we disagree and speak with civility. And part of civility is to really listen. So I think the, a big majority of residents feel that they're not listened to. Uh, so part of the role of city council, I believe, is to really listen. And part of the role of city staff is to really listen. And how do we know we're that get, they We're getting ready to go there. Yes. That, that's the next place we're going is roles, well, okay? I'm going to share a quote with a group uh, from Andy Stanley that says, leaders who don't listen will eventually be surrounded by people who have nothing to say. Okay. <laughs> Last comment from oh, back here. Thank yes, ma'am. seeing my hands. Oh, okay. I sense, I don't know why, there is the welding project it's not for my well-being. I, I have a concern that the city and the city council is not concerned about the well-being of the residents. I have to give you one, just one little example with traffic. I can't go to see my doctor in the morning at 8 o'clock because when I come back, I'm crucified. I have to sit in the freeway. I can't go out from here to visit my family after 1.30, I can't go to downtown, I can't go to Hollywood, I can't go to the valley, I can't go to nowhere. I can only go to the ocean, walking. You know, I am, I'm in circle here with traffic, and I'm not this, the only one I figured. So this catering of the developers, because they contribute to the, uh, Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna cut there if yeah. you don't mind. I'm gonna cut there yeah. because again, I'm I'm here. The question was about what are the potholes and detours. So I hear you, but I'm yeah. again in the essence of time. I'm gonna kind of cut the you there. Where we are. I understand. When I, they I, are, they're not concerned about the residents' well-being. I heard you. I I, I I've got. It. I, I do want to point out some other pothole that's sort of at a higher level, and that is data collection. And whether the data is scientifically collected or whether it's collected only by volunteers. In other words, you there are ways of collecting data scientifically and ways of collecting it not scientifically. And I think it's important that we adhere to scientific methods when we collect data. Okay. Any other thoughts up here on uh, potholes and detours before I move on. And again, I'm not going to get all the comments in the back there. I apologize, but I'm just watching the clock and trying to manage time. So please bear with me, okay? I would say the um, ability to um, get into the system with the loudest voices and the quietest voices or the silent folks who are satisfied are not really engaged in the conversation. Okay. Any other comments here? Any other comments here? Mm -hmm. Let's move on to roles. Uh, and let's first talk about, from your perspective, and I'd like to hear from uh, council on this, what do you see as council's role <laughs> in, in this movement here? So. Uh, so, uh, and, and I did this at a pretty high level, I think our, our role is setting policy and not micromanaging, and our goal is to communicate with the department heads, and especially with the public, to be able to um, be some kind of conduit between the public and the city, and I, I think we rely too much on our staff and too little on ourselves to set up that communication. Larry mentioned the idea of an electronic town hall, and that is actually how I came into being an activist in this town. We used to have a network called the Public Electronic Network, and I was the users group chair, and that was an online community where anybody could join in the conversation, including council members, which I was not one of at the time. Uh, it turned out that when I got elected to council, all of a sudden the rules changed because of a 1950s law called the Brown Act, and you have to be very careful about engaging in conversations that involve other council members because you have to make all your decisions in public. 
So the public town hall idea had to go by the wayside for me. But what I've tried to do is to be communicative and responsive to members of the public, uh, mostly via email for the last 20 years. And I see part of the role of the council as being the ear of the city, hearing what people have to say, and then referring people's concerns appropriately to staff if it's a problem that can be solved at that level, or incorporating that into formulating new city policy, which is our primary job, if that is what it takes. Um, not everybody hears back the answer they want. And the fact that you know, the city can't deliver exactly what you want doesn't mean we don't hear you. It just means we can't do that. Well, I want to uh, elaborate a little bit on, on Kevin's point, because we often hear that there is tremendous distrust of local government. And a lot of the people I hear that from, it's not really distrust. It's you didn't do what I wanted you to do. Sometimes we don't do what residents want us to do because we legally can't. You know, people, for example, say, why don't you guys go on Facebook, to Kevin's point. I don't go on Facebook and discuss policy because I don't know if Ted or Sue or Terry are looking at that, and I could easily violate the Brown Act completely unintentionally. But I also think that it's important for people to understand that I think the council's role is to make decisions at the 30,000 foot level. And by that I mean not what's best for this particular resident or this particular group of residents, but what's best for the city overall. And sometimes that means there are competing things where you have one group of residents who want you to do X and another group who want you to do Y, and it's our job to listen to everybody. But the fact that we may make a decision that neither X nor Y like and sometimes find things in the middle is because we're looking at what's best for the city overall, not what's best for this group of people or what's best for this particular neighborhood. Because that's our job, is we are supposed to be thinking about the city as an organism, as a, you know, something that has to be adaptable and work for everybody, which as our city manager says, a city that works for everybody and not for one particular group, perhaps at the expense of another. And I think that's a real challenge for us, but I think it's also a challenge for us to communicate that to residents who go, why didn't you do what I wanted you to do? Any other thoughts from council on council's role? Mm -hmm. About well, I just, I mean, I mean, I agree, obviously, clearly, I think it's, it's pretty self-evident. Our role is to be the policy makers and the legislatures. And as my colleagues have said, to be looking at everything from way up here. Um, and I do think we also have a role uh, to communicate with the public, which we do in a multitude of ways. I mean, I can't go to the grocery store or walk down Main Street without having someone share some sort of opinion about something with me, and we take that all in. But to, I will say, and I'll say this specifically to Rick, I, I enjoyed those community conversations we had at the end of last year. I thought that was a great opportunity. I'm, I'm a little old to Larry's idea about electronic town hall on Facebook. I, I see some of the, the rhetoric goes on in those media, um, which people are just sometimes just mean. And that's not the way to communicate with people is to be mean. But when we had those community conversations, those were by and large quite civil. That was an opportunity. It's a little harder being mean to someone when you're looking at them face to face than when you're typing away on your screen. And you, I mean, it's just human nature. <laughs> and so I, I would think we ought to create more opportunities for council members and department heads, et cetera, to go out and engage the community in, these, you know, in a forum like this on these issues and to have a civil and open dialogue about things that people are concerned about. Okay. Well, I was just going to say, um, you know, providing the bridge between what we hear from the community and what we hear from the professional management of the city and other cities to create ideas that work here. And then standing behind those with some constancy over time so that we can put the city apparatus in, in place to implement those ideas is one of the key functions I see for us. Okay. You know, I, mean, I would like to just echo what uh, Ted was saying in terms of this whole uh, electronic phenomenon that's happening. Uh, I remember when Penn started way back in the day, uh, I was always criticized for not getting on it. And I used to talk to some of the folks that were so big advocates of it. I tell them, I said, well, let's sit down in person. And then they, they opted not to sit with me. Uh, I've always been one to go out and reach out to the community. I think you learn so much when, when you're talking to people, whether it's a coffee clutch or, out, or a group like this, than you do electronically because I think a lot of people hide behind that 
and say things that they really don't mean, or they want to say things that they really uh, feel in terms of sometimes some very racist comments that you have no way of uh, counterbalancing unless you're going to sit on the, uh, on the computer all day. And I mean, quite frankly, I have a tough enough time just answering emails. I don't need to be on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. I mean, there's so many of these little things going on. I mean, for us, all of us here, we all have to make a living. And it's not being on the council. I think people forget that sometimes. So I think the more you can do in these type of interactions with groups and reach people that then turn around and talk to others, I think it's it's a better position, especially for us as policy makers. How about let's go to this row. What do you see as council's role? Be honest. Because <laughs> they want to say, get out of our way. <laughs> <laughs> is that what they want to say? Is you, you know that? <laughs> Don't everybody speak at once, Karen? I think it's what they said. Yeah. Yeah. Set, set policy. And to Terry's point, sort of stay disciplined through it. So you added the stay disciplined through it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, okay. As it's said and implemented. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Other thoughts from this row here? Yeah. I think it's to remind staff that we're supposed to do good um, administrative work and not let that work be filtered by politics. So I think council's role is to make sure that that gets communicated to staff. Okay. Other thoughts on this row? <coughs> no? Okay. Well, I mean, it's to um, the point about when things go wrong you got to step up and be willing to take the heat yeah sorry I, that's the reality right and not silence isn't really having staff's back when things go wrong and when particularly you know things will go wrong i'm not suggesting to you that we won't be accountable for it or responsible for it but if we're trying something new and you've asked us to be bold and try something new and if we get the structures and systems in place to be empowered to do those things and then they go wrong for whatever reason, whether it's in a small group or it's really, it goes wrong, it's perceived to go wrong, um, ultimately your words have to match your actions, as do ours. Okay. Other comments on this group? I, I, I just want to add that we all as policy makers may have different views about what the policy ought to be and so we don't always agree with each other about what ought to be done and so the question is once we pick something should we be acting as a unified front i mean i personally don't think so i don't know if other people think so but uh, because it's a policy that I think is wrong-headed, I, you know, I'm not going to be. No, I won't undermine it, but I'm not going to be working for it. I just have, I have to say that we have differences among us as to what policies ought to be about certain things. Anything else? Yeah, I find myself thinking a lot about this question of how you both hold the whole and disagree. And I think this is one of our challenges to figure out how to do that in a smart way so we kind of understand where people stand, but we remain open to new ways of doing things and to kind of iterating and changing things. So sometimes these are in conflict, right? Because you're trying to proceed down a path and then you're also really trying to be open to change. And I think this is part of what we're all grappling with. Can I just add that, you know, I. I I think that that's a reality, right? Mm -hmm. There are four to three votes. There, yeah. there are all sorts of different votes. But at the end of the day, we work for the council. Mm -hmm. We don't work to try to, you know, navigate that, you know, incredibly thin line between differing opinions. And so, while, you know, there will be a difference of opinion, if you want us to go. We have to go based on what the council has told us to do and not feel like we're walking on eggshells based on the disagreement mm -hmm. among the council. So I absolutely respect that there's going to be that tension between <coughs> individual opinions and ultimately the council's um, direction 
for us. I think I was speaking towards the, the reality that we're going to go once the council tells us to, and if the dissenting voices are undermining what we're trying to do, that sends a mixed message to us ultimately, and so that might actually get us to a place where we won't go as far as fast based on having to navigate that dissension. Well, our responsibility in all that, I think, and I've taken this more seriously as I've been on the council walk, is on matters of policy. I mean, not things like an appeal or something that might be still booked, but on matters of major policy. <coughs> As a council member, I try to work with my colleagues to find consensus to the extent at all possible. So that the direction to staff about what we want is as clear as possible and as undivided as possible so that you have the trust that you have the backing of the council. Because otherwise, a four to three policy decision that is iffy by you know one vote at the next election is never going to be effectively implemented. And if we mean to be good policymakers, I think that that becomes incumbent on us on major policy issues to work together to find consensus, sometimes to compromise and give up things we didn't want to give up, to find a way that we can all vote together. Things like the zoning code. You know, we eventually had a unanimous vote on that zoning code. That's not to say we all agreed on every part of that code. Absolutely not. But we came together as a council. I think that's what we owe to you as staff and to the community as residents is that we, to the extent we can, voice policy clearly with a unified voice. Yeah, and, and there are remarkably few of those moments where we disagree actually on meaningful policy matters that are sort of long term and, and uh, influential. And in the cases where we do, it's frequently about how we get there, right? Or how fast we can get there or what tools we employ to get there. and. So the, you know, the thrust of where we're going is still in the same direction, but it's oftentimes about sort of, um, uh, you know, when implementing what has been decided as a, as a compromise, we can often find ways to go forward for faster and satisfy the needs of those who wanted to go, you know, for the full board. Other comments here? I'm going to stay up here for a minute folks I'm going to stay up here and I'm going to move on to the department's role because I want this richness of this conversation to continue and then we're going to go to the CMO role and I'm going to stay up here and then I'll open it up back there but I want to stay up here on these next two questions for a few minutes um, let's move on to department's role what, what do you see is the department's role in this journey to the 21st century and let's start with uh, the department heads uh, uh, if you could air in on it I would say to implement um, council's policy and our areas of responsibility in collaboration with our fellow uh, departments, colleagues. Okay. I think it was mentioned in a previous section, but we need to be able to give our staff a better understanding of the citywide goals, give them that big picture view instead of them working on what they've worked on for 20 years, for example. Okay. So, so give them how they attach to the overall goal versus what their job is, per se. That's right. Okay. And this sentiment just earlier, but part of our role is to illuminate the choices and trade-offs for council so they feel like they can make good decisions. Okay. I think it's uh, being able to uh, be comfortable with taking risks and, and then managing those risks and, and what we do and, and what we're proposing to council okay. okay I think we're responsible for communicating all the way down through all levels of the organization what the goals of the city are based on council's decisions and making sure that everybody understands what that is even at the very um, you know basic levels of people who are out providing our um, staff who's providing services to the citizens so they understand what their role is okay Got a lot more seats occupied up here. I think we're responsible for spending the, the um, community's money in a prudent way and 
prudent may involve risk and it may involve doing things in a new way, but I think ultimately we have to be responsible and accountable for spending um, the resources that we have, both human capital and financial capital, in the most responsible way possible. Yes? Well, I'm often guilty of asking staff to do things that I don't know how to do uh, because I'm setting a policy. I don't know how to implement the policy. I want more than just straight ahead implementation of what the council has determined as a policy. I want innovation. I want the application of expertise. I want creativity. Um, I, I want the staff to feel that the council has their backs for them to try things that we've never tried before because that's going to be the success of the future. Otherwise, we just keep replicating what we've done. Uh, you know, for my part, I have to be careful when then issues come up to ask questions and not give direction because I'm one council member, I'm not the council, to, to monitor what's going on because ultimately, as a council member, I'm the one who's responsible to the community for how things turn out. But I really hope that departments will be creative and communicate among each other so that the implementation of a policy in one department that may have an unanticipated impact on another department doesn't cause a problem. It just causes an adjustment. Well, and I, building on that a little bit is I, I too believe that we rely on staff to be experts. I think people frequently forget that Santa Monica has a different city government structure than what they see, for example, in the city of Los Angeles, where you have full-time council members with full-blown individual staffs who are out there not only meeting with the public but gaining expertise. We, as volunteers who in theory all have day jobs that don't involve being on the city council, really rely on staff to be our experts. And so it's important for them, one, to exercise that expertise, as I said before, without regard to politics. That's our job is to filter, use the politics filter. But two, I really rely on staff. We may, because we are not experts. We all come from different backgrounds. I'm not a city planner. I'm certainly not a fire chief or a police chief or a, in charge of libraries. or So if we as a council come up with an idea, which I'm sure we do more frequently than we should, an idea that is either unsustainable or not um, in the best interest of the city, maybe because it has unintended consequences somewhere else, or is just not implementable in the way we've given it. I want staff to have the courage um, as experts to say, that's not going to work. I mean, they don't, it doesn't have to be an immediate pushback, but if we give direction and staff looks at it and says, no can do for whatever reason, because it's not legal or whatever, come back to us and say, no can do. We'll try and figure out some other way to accomplish our goal. But I think sometimes staff feels, well, this was the council's direction, and by God, we're going to figure out a way to implement it. And what ends up happening is, as Katie mentioned, maybe a sort of half-hearted implementation, because everyone knows they really can't do it, or it's the old passive-aggressive model of it goes to the bottom of the pile to get <laughs> implemented. And I think it would just be more open and transparent for everyone if staff were able to come back and say, you know what, that really wasn't a good idea. Let us give you a different way to achieve your goal, or you need to figure out a different way to achieve your goal. And we have to be adult enough to take that like adults. So I'm going to go in a different direction. Uh, I have a very specific thought about one department. And um, we see a lot of the department heads on a regular basis in our meetings. I can't recall the last time I was at a council meeting and David Martin wasn't sitting in the front row because <laughs> there was something going on with PCD. But Joseph here, it seems to me what we're talking about doing in 21st century government, so much of what his department does is the linchpin of that, whether it's the, the data collection, whether it's a new website that better, better enables our community to navigate through our government, uh, the implication of community broadband now that we're here over, where net neutrality has been rescinded and people from private providers of internet services will have some restrictions on the content they receive. So much of what we want to do to be transparent and open and measure data is, is contingent on what his department does. And we don't hear from him a whole lot. And I say this to Rick, I would, you know, if we have you have account your city manager items, let's get Joseph up there on a more regular basis to keep us abreast of what, because we don't often have to make policy decisions about his department. But I think as a council, we'd be better served if we understood what his department was doing more often, because I think it's so important to 21st century government. 
So uh, I think that um, there's a lot of, um, of what we aren't seeing, but I just want to say what I have seen since I've been on the council, because I think there's been a dramatic improvement in our staff reports and in the options you give us, and I want you to know that I really appreciate that, that I think the more options we get, the better equipped we are to make a decision. And, uh, and I've definitely seen that happening, and, uh, and I just don't want to see that stop. I don't want to see an internal decision made about, oh, we can't do this or we can't do that. And I like the idea of putting everything on the table, including things that may seem far-fetched, and letting us say, yes, we want to try that, you know, even if on a limited basis. But I do appreciate what you guys have done over the last four years. Yeah, I think so. Just elaborating on that a little bit, just being able to surface those moments where what we th think is, you know, when we're in an implementation of a policy mode and then in implementing some direction, we realize a policy matter kind of surfaces. Bringing that up quickly so that we can resolve it quickly so that we don't slow down as a team in moving forward on making change happen where we need it, right? I think that's really kind of a critical role the, about the nimbleness of our communications and our governance and how we work together. Other thoughts here? Let's go to the city manager's office role. What do you see as their role? Circus ringmaster. Circus <laughs> ringmaster. <laughs> On that comment, I'll tell you my circus story. Santa Monica is like a circus. I mean, I come here frequently, it is. You have two side rings and you got the main ring. The only thing I want to mention to you is make sure what's important is always in the main ring, not in the side rings. Because as you go down through the organization at Santa Monica and you talk to workers, sometimes they think what's in the side ring is in the main ring. And they get it very, very confused. Well, and if I can elaborate on that, because I said it to be funny, but also because I think that the city manager's job, it, it, it really is um, to make sure that we as a council stay focused on the priorities that we identified. We, um, being human beings, have a tendency to grasp onto the shiny object flying through the sky. And it's amazing how a single project or issue can occupy huge amounts of time, and, and disproportionately so. It's not to say it's not a good idea or something we shouldn't talk about but we can spend a lot of time talking about things that are relatively simple at, to the detriment of things that we ought to be spending more time on. So I think it's the city manager's job to kind of wrangle us, to keep us focused on these are the priorities you set, these are the things we're gonna discuss, this is where we're gonna spend money, that sort of thing. But I also think as we've heard about from the city um, staff is, you know, they all, the city manager also has to face the other way and remind staff, this is the council's priorities, this is what we're focusing on. You know, yes, you're spending a lot of money or time or effort on something that came up in a 13 item, but remember, this is the goal, as you say, this is what's in the center ring. Um, there's no way we're going to eliminate the two side rings. That's just the nature of humanity and the nature of a large institution. But I think um, the city manager is the one who is supposed to keep both council and staff and, quite honestly, the community focused on what's in the center ring so that we are all generally pulling in the same direction, that we have these agreed upon goals, and that we continue to make those our primary focus rather than get distracted by things that may be very exciting or very meaningful, but at the same time are not where we should be spending 50% of our time because they don't really move the ball. Again, talking about that 10,000 foot level, they don't move the whole community ball forward. It moves one little group's priority forward. Did you have your hand up, Sue? Uh, I didn't, although I usually do, but I have a question for you. <laughs> since you're <laughs> I thought I saw your hand. It's a good assumption. <laughs> yeah, it's a good assumption. Right, just, um, so you talked about your observation that we're so often focused on the side ring and not on the main ring, and I want to know what that came out of. Um, it just comes out of talking to people. Um, uh, again, it's uh, one of the things that I sense within Santa Monica is there's a lot on the plate. And there's always been a lot on the plate. I arrived here in 1996, there was a lot on the plate. 
Um, what's different about these chairs? Different faces. But there still is a city council, there's a lot on the plate. And if you're going to be successful as a city in Mark's organizational effectiveness model, you're always going to have the side <coughs> ranks, always. And each job has side ranks, okay? Uh, my side ring when I leave here today is taping that off and make sure it stays in the sections that it's on, but it's a side ring. Um, my main ring is basically the exercise we went through. So it's making sure there's clarity on that and what that does is that allows the relief valve of some of the folks that are currently feeling overloaded to put it in context and know where it is. And the question I ask all the time, and I, I'm not asking that it get answered here today, but I ask these department heads that every time I meet with them, what can you stop doing? Because normally we don't think in those terms. We think of adding things. We don't think in terms of we can stop doing this, 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 and this. And, and that's how you stay out of things going into the side ring is, is really, does council ever have a discussion, whether it be on record or, 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 or in a meeting or, or informally about maybe we should look at stop doing these things that we started and aren't really yielding? You know, how many of the staff heads that are here were here in the early 90s? I'd be curious. How about how many are boomerangs? <laughs> well, I'd be curious from at least, right, exactly. all <laughs> at least from the three of you, because uh, you know I know some of my colleagues back then were probably a little bit more. I think we're a little bit more demanding than this council, and I don't know if you all witnessed that or or feel the same way. <laughs> I would say I was in yeah, a different, different position. Yeah. Oh, you're in a different position? Yeah, so I was in a different position. Well, you were well, here. I was, I was in a different position, but I still But you're still in the city manager. manager. I, I, would, I would say it was just a differently energetic group of people. <laughs> the council. I mean, it was the council, right? It, I mean, it was before social media, but it was at a time when um, email was... Um, new and interesting to folks and it was a time when pen was a very active um, avenue so if you took that um, you know cable tv was a very active um, avenue for communication um, you know so my my sense of things is is that um, it really was just a differently energetic and differently you know focused group of people. I, I've never met a council that was more laid back and not interested in, I mean, other people will have other observations, but I think it's, there's consistency in the desire for excellence. <laughs> I would just say that I think a lot of the issues are the same, but the intensity and the input and the speed and the aspiration to do a lot with all those issues has just been amplified. So it, it feels like there's a certain sort of amplification of things, probably for a lot of the reasons Katie said. I think many of the issues that we're aspiring to as a community feel very consistent over time, but we're just trying to do those and a lot more. So that'd be my take. I, I guess when I was just, when I was hitting it, is that at least from my colleagues back then, I got the feeling a couple of them were trying to do maybe more micromanaging of the staff, and I just didn't know if those that were here felt that. So the question is, what's the role of the city manager, right? And to me, it's a very short answer. It's to do everything we're talking about here. Make this all happen. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, in the next hour. <laughs> and it, Not and in the next and hour. And, and his ringmaster hat is on the way. We're huh? talking about a very long view here, but we're having a pr productive conversation, and you'll distill all that into some sort of report and analysis. But I think that for Rick and his team, you know, that is their challenge is to take this input on what does 21st century government look like and how can we get there and be as effective and responsive and nimble as possible, which, yeah, granted, that's a huge undertaking, but that's their role. 
Well, I have a bit of a longer list than 10, actually. Um, we've already talked about focus and how important it is to the city manager's office to uh, keep the council focused on what's important and what's doable. So three years ago, we landed on five focused goals, which we've been working on. I saw on the early slide tonight that we might be looking at adding public safety, which I would support. But we have to be careful not to let that be 15 or 25 priorities, because then nothing is a priority. Now, the other side of that for the city manager, while keeping us focused, is then to decide what are the available resources and how do those resources get prioritized among the departments to achieve those focused goals. I think those have always been part of the city manager's <coughs> office's role, whether back in the 90s or now. I mean, back in the 90s, you listened to music about vinyl. We still listen to music just in different ways. But there's some things we've added on, I think, with the hiring of Rick. I think there's a, a new set of expectations the council has developed. One is we hired Rick as an innovator. And, and that means in thinking of new ways to do things more efficiently, more responsively to the community, more to effectuate the uh, policy goals set by the council. Another thing we now hope we get from the city manager's office, and I think we do, is vision. A vision for what this community could be, can be, should be, will be, uh, which is tied into the council's policy decisions, but goes beyond that as well. Because again, we're all part-timers who work in different fields and who don't have the same kind of overview that the city manager's office is privy to. And the last one, which has come up most recently with the council's uh, assigning resources for communications in the city manager's office, is something we didn't used to have, which is we rely on the city manager's office for communications to a new level. Uh, I try to email back and forth with residents, but there's 93,000 of you and only one of me. Uh, so it's a little bit imbalanced there. We now have professional staff to help us get word out to the community about what we're doing, why we're doing it, what the options are, where the input points are if you want to be heard. Uh, we have meetings like this that are attended by a certain number of people. We'll have another meeting in another month attended by another group of people. It's part of the city manager's office's job, along with the council, to take all those inputs from different people who at different times with different groups have different opinions and try to make sense out of that. So I think that that's the last of the big five for me. Focus, resources, innovation, vision, and communication. Okay, thank you. Um, I was just going to add that I think that uh, I completely lost the idea. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin's list was too long. Comes back to me. Comes back to me. Yeah. Other thoughts? Other thoughts on city manager's office role? Andy said one thing that's a little more internal, but we tend to as departments to be focused on sort of our areas of expertise, and the manager's office helps us sort of see the trends and the opportunities and challenges that go across the organization that we might not otherwise see. Okay. Got it back. Okay. Um, I think the CMO office also uh, has an important role in, in uh, managing the throttle. Um, how fast are we going? Um, when, you know, back to this notion of sort of filtering policy and, and, and management, um, you know, when is an issue well within the direction already given um, and go forward? And when is it in uh, a category where we have to have another conversation about it? Um, you know, what are the problems we power through? How do we get to, um, you know, the, you know, putting forward the idea that you've got the resources you need, go forward, move fast, those kinds of, you know, that throttle decision is very much in the CMO's office. Okay. Yes, sir. I think um, this is really what Andy just shared, but I think the sort of connective tissue role that we play and also sort of the convening role that we play is within the departments and then also, um, you know, if advocates or community members come to us making sure that the right departments are looped in, the right voices are at the table to receive and put or make decisions. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Specifically with regard to this transition to 21st century government, government is the idea of um, 
moving quickly to put in place the different systems that the internal staff can use to deliver. Because there's a, a ton of work that is the city's bread and butter that is really important that people need consistency in what they're doing. But as we transition, I think the challenge is, is that the transition doesn't get sort of killed by a thousand cuts exactly. and sort of setting up uh, and these are micro things, but sort of making sure we attend to the micro things quickly so we can transition with respect for the bread and butter work that has to sort of continue, but also be starting to move it without without that being so painful that people get squeezed. Any other thoughts? Any other thoughts? Yeah? Uh, yeah. I just I maybe it's more specific to the department heads and such, but um, I agree with everything else has been said, but with create an environment where there is um, a high expectation of, of honest dialogue about what can be done, what can't be done, um, and then support to, to, to get the job done, but then also holding everyone accountable. I think that one of the things, uh, uh, to, to function at the high level and do all the things we want to do, we have to function at a high level, and um, I, I think that, that we need to function well as a team. I think that's one of the directions we're trying to get out of the city manager's office when they are doing a good job at. But I, I think accountability is a big part of it. And so when we do something that's innovative, even if it doesn't work, it's okay if, if on the front end we've had honest dialogue about the direction, what we can do, agreed on it, and then um, get through it. And accountability, not in, in the sense of, um, in fact, I beat somebody up, but but there is there should be high expectations and there should be a, an expectation of uh, whether it's budgetary or the internal uh, discipline within a department or any of those things, I think that that's, that's their role too, to clearly establish some of these things in a relationship, but then hold that line at times too. Okay. I agree with everything that's been said, but one of the other things I think that the CMO does for all of us is listen to our aspirations and visions and articulate that back to council uh, for each of the ways that we want to improve our department to be more responsive to our community. Any other thoughts? I'm going to go back here for. I uh, uh, appreciate all that's been said and benefit from hearing your perspectives. The one that, that I think got missed because it's so obvious is it's my responsibility to build the team. I'm the one who picks the assistant city manager, the deputy city manager, the key roles in the city manager's office, and all of the department heads. So. Kevin said that uh, sometimes truth uh, struggles to get its pants on. The city manager puts his pants on one leg at a time. And the only way all of this stuff gets done is by building a superb team, first by getting the best people, then by helping them get the job done so that they have all the resources of technology and training um, and, the, and the atmosphere that that Bill was just talking about, is creating an environment where the best people can succeed. I think that's my number one job. Okay. And, and the, probably the reason you didn't come up is because, other than having to fill Donna's shoes, you've done such a great job of it. And we consider it mission accomplished, to use an unfortunate yeah. expression that <laughs> <laughs> Republican <laughs> presidents have hijacked. <laughs> I, just, I want to acknowledge, I think we all feel that way. And, and we will take credit for Lane, however. <laughs> and yes. Before we move back, I want to, uh, the city attorney's office obviously is not part of council, is not part of the CMO, and is not a department head. Um, but I wanted to acknowledge that we also play a role here and one of the ways that we consider that role is to help structure this conversation in a way that is democratic legal and has integrity and we take that role very seriously so I just wanted to acknowledge that before we move any other thoughts comments I'm going to open it up back here if you have any comment but I'm going to ask that it be to roles only please and if not I'm going to cut you off yes, I want to elaborate on Lynn Gill's uh, comment on her just recent comment on, on structuring an authentic and legal conversation because I hosted one, the first of the community conversations, and I was very excited to be part of, of that uh, initiative, but there was a messaging in place. So I found the messaging, and when there's an agenda that is to push a message, it's not authentic. And that structure I share with our city manager doesn't work. Doesn't work. We really want to have 
authentic conversations. So on, you know, that they're structured, but they're unscripted. And when you don't have a script to follow, that's when genuine authenticity, innovation, and creativity happens. Okay. And I'm going to stop you there again. I want to comment on the role of council, the role of the department heads, the role of CMO, um, and stay very focused in those areas. Money, uh, ma'am. Um, I'd like to speak to the role of council. The, the voting record shows that there's a division within the council. Four council members regularly vote for big development and three against. So there doesn't seem to be a great deal of cohesiveness between all seven members across the board. So the voting record says it all. There is a split. They don't see eye to eye. And maybe there's a better way for them to find that ground. Okay. May I comment on that? Please? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so uh, I do think that on 99% of the things we vote on, there actually is a cohesive view. I think the development issues are a problem in every community throughout the state. I don't think that that is the defining issue here. If you do, I understand that you feel we're highly divided, but other than that issue, I really think that we are pretty unified in our approach. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I think the council's main responsibility is to represent. And obviously you can't keep all the people happy all the time, but the people that, there's an old saying that the oil, the, the, grease the, the, the change that needs, the, squeaks the loudest, gets the oil. And a lot of times, uh, this mistrust from, that, we, that citizens seem to have towards City Hall is because they feel like they're, they're complaining and they have issues and the City Council isn't listening. Regarding uh, staff and City Manager, I'm very wary of the, them being biased and even influential in setting policy. Okay, thank you. I saw a hand in the middle of the crowd here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I heard kind of took a lot of what I wanted to say there because I do believe that the role of elected officials is to represent the people who voted them for them, whether voted, voted them in, in any way or shape or form. So setting policy is the second level. Right, because representing the will of the people doesn't necessarily always line up with the policies that you select. And I think that needs to be looked at in a broad framework to say, am I actually making decisions that I believe are representing the people who elected us? Second of all, um, when we talk about staff, I am concerned about staff keeping up with the information that's coming in to them. Their role is to keep up with it and to implement the policies that are in place, um, not to do anything other than that. Um, when new information comes in, is it actually being used in the public meetings that are being held? Or is it being held back? It should be out there in front and center so that the public is just as aware of what's there as staff is and council should be aware because it's visible. Okay. So transparency. Okay. Um, and the role of the city manager is to make sure that all of this folds in together, that the policy is being made for the people by the council. Thank you. Um, I think the role of the council is to create policy. And then the role of the departments is to deliver innovative programs and activities that execute the policies. And then the role of the city manager's office is to create the systems that allocate the resources and allow us to track our progress on meeting the goals that are established by council when they create policy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
so that we get that uh, feedback loop. Okay. All right. Any other hands? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, this is a wonderful conversation, and for holding it here in the Pico District. Um, I am from Gundara neighborhood right over there. I know most of you, and your role, as Ann said, is to represent the people who elected you. I voted for all of you. Uh, on the preschool fight at 2953 Delaware Avenue on my street, we were ignored summarily by all of you, by the planning division, the planning commission, if the commissioners are here, I don't know, uh, summarily ignored. So the role is to represent the will of the people. This is a representative democracy. We were ignored entirely. In terms of some concrete suggestions on communication, David, planning division, when you send out your notifications of some big project, maybe have the staff person, in our case it was Elizabeth Barrell, actually interface with the community. There was none of that about a very significant policy change of putting a commercial development into an R1 residential neighborhood. This is a concrete example of lack of it. I don't know what can be done. So I'm going to send out the flyers. Can I cut you off here? Okay. This isn't a feedback, this isn't a feedback session. Well, this is a role discussion. So yeah, I'm talking about roles and communication. Okay. And so we feel we were ignored by our representatives. I, I got that piece. Okay. I got but, that piece. But what about you. the other people? Pardon? What about people who might have had a different opinion? No, I'm going to ask them. Oh, okay. Welcome. Hi. Other thoughts? Yes, ma'am. I actually just wanted to give hats off to everybody today. When we talk about a great example of how to deal with public discourse, this is it. So thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I heard an interesting comment. I don't mean to pick out some, what someone said, but it was that the staff works for the count up for the council people. But I've noticed in talking to a lot of my neighbors in recent weeks that people feel very disenfranchised that staff has an actual hostility towards the residents. And I don't know how to approach that differently. I was involved, as Tony said, 30 years ago, and we never felt that. Mm -hmm. But I've noticed everyone, many people I spoke to, I was shocked that almost every other person said, oh, good luck, but city staff doesn't pay attention, they're openly hostile to the neighborhood. Or to the, when I called them about such and such, or when I dealt about something, and I, I always thought staff worked for us, the residents, and then reported to the council, or, you know, also told the council. So that might be something to work on. So let's move to the final question. Well, Mark? Yep, go ahead. Before we do that, we right. talked about the roles of the council, the role of the city manager's <coughs> office, the role of the staff. It's curious to me, we didn't talk about the role of the residents, of our constituents, because if we're going to achieve this new form of governance we want to, it's got to be collaborative. And that means that all the players have to be working together, trying to cooperate. So I'm just curious what thoughts we all might have. How could and obviously residents want us to be better partners with them. How could residents be better partners with City Hall? Because if it is an antagonistic presumption that people are being ignored, then that will self-perpetuate. How, how do we break out of that? I mean, the fact that we listen and then make decisions based on values that may not always please individual constituents doesn't mean we're not doing our job. Our job is to listen to everybody in the community and synthesize good policy. So how can we break out of what seems to have sprung more recently out of social media talk that the council and the staff are openly hostile to residents? Because I know personally, I'm not openly hostile to residents, but I hear that all the time. Okay. So what is the role of residents? What, what should residents be doing to be better participants? I think in that's government? a great question to veer off on and, and talk about a little bit. I mean, you want to start back there? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I agree with the Speak up so everybody can hear you, please. Stop cutting them off when you speak. Okay. 
Kevin, thank you so much for bringing that up because I believe that there um, is our um, role as well that is missing in um, this part. I believe that um, once a decision is made that we are not happy with, we should try to figure out how it is that we can work together with others so that way we can come into a cohesive way of working together. And that is why I brought up the fact that if you ever have a perfect example of how to deal with this course, it is today. Because this is the way that we need to do it. And bringing us forward so that way we can open a discussion as opposed to having a three minute discourse or demands or uh, whatever it is that we bring forth is such a better way of going into the 21st century. Yes, sir. Uh, I think that's a good point that Kevin brought up. I, I, uh, and and uh, I think what needs to happen is that there needs to be more back and forth communication. Yeah. There, you know, we go to city council meetings and we speak for two minutes and see you later, okay? There is no uh, uh, discourse that really accomplishes anything but residents saying what they would like to see and city council members saying great. And then that's it, okay? We need to have more response and communication back and forth between city council members and residents. Social media, social media is social media, okay? People can do, say whatever they want there, and, and, and I appreciate the fact that city council members don't go on Facebook because sometimes it does, doesn't, it, it isn't civil. So I can understand that. But there has to be a way that communication is better between city council members and residents. Right now, it's not. Yes. Well, so as a council member, I may have a little different perspective. But I would hope that the role of residents is to treat each other the way they want to be treated. I think one of the things that really has troubled me, maybe it's with the advent of social media and maybe from before that, is that a lot of people feel intimidated about speaking because there are louder voices that shout them down. And so I think that the role of residents is to give us input. Our role is to listen, but the role of residents is also to hear that other residents may disagree with them and to respect that disagreement and understand that if you believe X and someone else believes Y, we are obligated to listen to both X and Y. And that's not to say X is right or Y is right. We have to synthesize that, as Kevin says. But I think residents need to treat each other with respect and respect the civility that we all want to be in the process. Because when people feel intimidated about being in the minority or disagreeing with other people who may have a louder voice, we're not getting the input we need to make the best decisions. So I think the question that may come out of all of this is, is it an incumbent upon us as council people who are dealing with uh, uh, residents who don't always agree on things to create a forum, so to speak, other than city council meetings, where people can express their views about various issues in a way that we, and it may have been like the community conversation, because the one that I took part in certainly was not, uh, there were different points of view, but people were able to talk to each other without being angry and not being time limited. And, and maybe it is incumbent upon us to create various forums uh, uh, so people can discuss things. Yes. And, it, and it can't be various forum. I mean, if you mean by forums, it can't be just meetings. Because frankly, if you're somebody who's in your 20s or 30s, you're married, you have children, you might not have the time to come out. You want to express your opinion. So we have to look to different ways of getting input from people. And we have to build more tolerance. Because just from what I've heard here, there's this intolerance. If you don't vote the way I want you to, you know, it sounds, it, you know, it starts sounding like you're, you're wrong. You know, you, you, you did something bad. Um, you're not listening to us. But there's a wide range of opinions in the community. So we all have to learn to be more tolerant with each other and be able to discuss. The, and then if it doesn't go your way, you say, hey, next time I'm going to try to influence and see how maybe I can get it to go my way. But, but maybe what we need to do is be sitting down more with people and saying instead of from the dais 
saying to their faces, I don't necessarily agree with you or I don't agree with you at all. Write to their face and let them say why they think you're, you know, and maybe not a stupid idiot, but why you're wrong, right? <laughs> right. Well, that kind of discussion can always go on, and, and, you know, with individuals. But when you're seeking input from people, you need to be careful to make sure that you're seeking input on a number of platforms because otherwise it is skewed to those folks who have the time to articulate, who have the ability to articulate, who are going to be there face to face. Not everyone can be there face to face. So we just always have to be careful to recognize that we represent everyone in Santa Monica and they're going to approach us in a variety of ways. So the way we do public input legally is not a 20th century form, it's a 19th century right. mm -hmm. form. The mayor of uh, Missoula, Montana, not criticizing anyone in Santa Monica, because this is a bigger problem than our 8.3 square miles. He said public hearings are that place in American society where no one listens. So when you have a, a public hearing and everyone has two minutes, I think we all know the limitations of that. We have tried to strive to begin to change that. Um, the community conversations was one example. I think we did um, some better public outreach around the downtown community plan, and we're certainly putting a lot of thought into how we approach the PICO discussions coming up, both the land use plan and the broader co-creation of, of, of better community services using this Virginia Avenue Park as, as a model. So uh, I, think, I think, Kevin, it's great that we're talking about the residence role, because I think if we're going to have 21st century government, we have to stop doing 19th century input. And it's not our fault. We, the Brown Act and the state laws, we inherit and we have to abide by. But we can go beyond that and outside that. And it does take both sides, because um, I'll be very frank, I'm not so much speaking for myself, because I have a thick skin after 36 years of public service. But when residents are overtly hostile to staff on a continuing basis, it's just human nature that some of that is going to seep back. No matter how professional they try to be, no matter how uh, understanding they try to be, no matter how empathetic they try to be, when they're routinely castigated as corrupt and evil, um, they begin to write people off. And, and, and I, I think that's a loss for all of us. So I think lowering the temperature all around so that we have more mutual respect and we have the opportunity to interact with people in less hostile, antagonistic, and obsolete ways will go a long way toward bringing us together as a community. Thank you, Kevin, for that incredible input. And thank you, Glean, for bringing the golden rule to the room. So the city voted for the Charter for Compassion that is the essence of the Golden Rule and is the essence of civic engagement. And I also appreciate Rick Paul's comment on lowering the temperature. But those things don't <coughs> happen by magic. Those things need a cohesive strategy that moves the needle in that aspect. So I am a little bit disappointed that after the vote unanimously of the Charter for Compassion, there has been nothing done, no funding, to really do initiatives that move the needle and create that environment where we can lower the temperature, agree to disagree, and do it civilly. So if we do not invest the resources, this is not going to happen. I have use my own money to do this. And this is one of the examples that I, I as a resident engage, but I don't have your support. And I would love to see your support because it's been discussed, it's in the room, and as Sue Himmerlich said, she wants to see everything on the table. Well, this is everything on the table. And I think we're making progress here. The conversation is getting really interesting and really uh, genuine and authentic. But again, even if we disagree politically, we need to come together and say, you know, let's take a, cha a, cha a challenge. Let's take this risk. And the golden rule doesn't only apply to people. It also applies to the environment. It also applies to a different um, variety of issues. So if we really want to have civility, 
then go to the policy that was implemented in December of 2011, that is the civility policy, then go to the vote of the Charter for Compassion in September 2013, and then move. And don't make signs to stop me speaking, because I resent that. That's when the hostility happens. You know, I just saw that interaction. That is not authentic communication. I, that, I, 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 that wasn't a sign to stop, stop you. That was a sign that he wants to speak next and, well, and just, be signal. Okay. Just wait for me to finish. No, no, I, I, but again, it, it's, I, 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 I think you, there's a good demonstration, okay? He, he showed me a hand that he wanted to speak next. He was not giving me any sort of eye contact. Wait. Yes, sir. You're adults. So I wanted to comment on this issue, which I myself brought up, about our all thinking together about how residents can be a more effective part of government, just as we want the cops to be more effective, staff to be more effective, the city manager to be more effective. And, and this goes back to an image that, that Rick has brought up of government as a vending machine. You know, people think of us as a transactional thing. You drop in your coin, you get the thing you want. We very often interact, local government and local residents, on specific decisions and issues. And people will have very firm opinions on that specific issue or decision. And unfortunately, when things don't go the way that an individual wants, sometimes instead of going to, well, why did that happen, people assume, well, there must have been some motive. The council sold out. The staff sold out. They're beholden to somebody. Ascribing motives to other people is a very divisive way to effectively end a discussion. And something I've learned is of, of use to me is when I disagree with somebody, I try to understand what's the difference in our values? How do our values translate into the action we're taking? And is there a way that we can see the and identify the shared part of our values to come to a decision that satisfies what we both care about? Not the transactional thing, but the cooperational thing, the seeking a shared solution. Not, I'll give you this, you give me that, but hey, let's work together to see if what we want for our community is achievable through dialogue and teamwork. So, I mean, that's, that's the whole reason why I asked that we add the fourth category of what does this team do to make it work, to add residents, because I think without your help, we can't do it. brought up the Google plan and I think um, we're looking forward to that as being as all these things play out the 21st century government right and so what does that look like we can't get there we're still using the bodies and the things in place that we currently have so for instance this people plan will have to include the various groups in the neighborhoods and not just have a neighborhood organization lead it because the neighborhood organizations don't speak for everyone in the neighborhoods. And so here is where there's this opportunity, but also this intentional way of doing things differently, right? And so there's all these different groups and they're gonna have to be pulled in um, so that they can have an invested say um, in deciding what happens in their neighborhood going forward, as well as the department heads will have to do differently, whereas they'll have to work in a collective way. And so planning had said at one of the meetings, <coughs> well, we can't do all these things that are now part of the plan because we all we do is planning. I appreciate that. That's what they do. Um, another department does this, but they all have to come together and work as a collective and not fighting with each other. It can be sustainability trying to do something that undermines well-being, et cetera, et cetera. It's got to be this collective work. And I don't think people really know how to work collectively. And working collectively entails leaving egos at the door and thinking not about ourselves, what we want, or that being right is what I want, or winning is what needs to happen, but that we're here, that departments are here to be of service, right, and do the best they can to write my residents. And so I think, um, and the council's role in that is to 
ensure that the loudest squeaky voices aren't undermining the work that needs to happen and that people aren't playing politics with the work that needs to happen and really be people of courage and, and have the work happen organically with all the different people and not just the one who's saying, but this, this is who I am and this is the body I'm in and therefore you need to hear us and we're the ones leading the work. Um, so this is, um, I think this could be like the first actual engagement exercise activity towards this 21st century government. And we're all gonna see how it's gonna play out and how it's gonna play out, how depending on what happens, we'll see whether we can actually do that or whether we can because we're just draining our own stuff. Yeah, uh, right. And and just kind of spin off what was just said too. You know, politics is part of this. And while we're all here working, trying to say let's work together as community, we need to recognize there are always going to be some people in the community who, for whatever the political reason is, they're going to say they're going to use an action or decision. And if they see some discontent, they might use that to try to stir it up to kind of you know, crank up the flame to create polarization. So while every, I, I, I take that everyone here is here with a good intent, but there could be people out of the community again who are saying, hey, this is an opportunity for me to get people riled up, to polarize. So that's why we each have to take a step back always and, and recognize that. And before we go off a deep edge, you know, that somebody was evil or somebody was corrupt or, you know, somebody's no longer my friend because they did something, you know, before you go off that cliff to, you know, take that deep breath and, you know, and talk to people and, you know, again, dial it back a bit and not always just follow some path, um, negative path. So we need to look for that positivity and need to try to talk more and work as a community. But recognize there are always going to be some forces that, for whatever reasons, want to stir things up. And it's harder today in a lot of ways um, because it's so easy to stay in your bubble now. Mm -hmm. And the real thing that we're talking about, I think, is finding ways to get in someone else's shoes mm -hmm. and taking the hard step to create a bridge and to have a dialogue. And that's the real role of a citizen in this democracy today, I think. And in so many ways, we've just made it harder. It's funny, I dropped off my daughter, at, uh, the other one, at, uh, <laughs> at, at for a bat mitzvah today. They picked up at 9 o'clock. They returned at 11 p.m. And her anxiety about whether her friends are there and who she'll talk to for all of that time is exactly what we're talking about yeah. here, right? Like, what is the safe bubble? And um, how do you find a way to get over that and do the hard work of communicating with people and building alliances and constituencies and having real dialogue to solve problems? And that's the role for all of us as citizens today. Last comment on roles. Um, I agree with what Pam said. I like what she said. There are a lot of misleading personalities in, in anything, especially politics. So I think, again, the track record <coughs> speaks loudly where it's at and who, who's talking the truth. So let's move on to the last question. And again, I'm looking at the clock, so please bear with me here. Could I please, this is just a quick comment on- what oh, Sure, quick comment. Was. Thank you. Um, the comment had been made, and I totally agree, that you guys are all working, and the amount of time that you have to research and understand the content of what's before you every meeting is enormous. So all due respects to every single one of you because I can't imagine having that role. That said, <laughs> nothing ever comes up as to how that can be made better for you. And, and that conversation needs to happen. Do you need staff, your own staff? Because there's so much going on and it's happening all at once. And there's a lot to look at. There's a lot of points of view that need to be taken into consideration. And you can't do it, you know, two minutes speaking, and you can't do it even in a 10 minute conversation. 
someone spends a lot of time, days, actually, looking at research to say, wow, this is interesting, I never knew that, I never knew that. You can't possibly do it on your own. You can't. There's just not enough hours in the day, not enough days in the week, not enough weeks in the month, and not enough months in the year to do it. And to really fulfill the obligation of, of being elected and having to make these really difficult policy choices. I would love to see you guys engage in a conversation about having someone or a couple of people on staff, whether it's staff, I mean, it can't be staff, but of your choosing who are, you know, not one linear kind of perspective, but works because it seems like there's just too much to be making these kinds of decisions on your own. Thank, Thank you. you. So let's move on to the last question. Uh, we've got about uh, 20 minutes to go here. Um, and the last question was, what does success look like? Uh, and I'll start that conversation off. Obviously, we could list a lot of things under the communications, what success looks like. It sounds like a whole bunch that we could list. But what does success look like? If we move the needle, and you're not, again, uh, we're not talking about arriving. We're talking about moving the needle. If we move the needle and everybody here in this room feels better as a result of the movement of the needle towards the 21st century government, what does that look like? Start here. You, you got elected for a purpose. I hear you. <laughs> so I, I think that everybody has to be braver. I mean, I think that people came into this job certainly with ideas of what they believe in. I think that we all probably have a framework in which we operate and a belief framework that we operate in. And I think that um, we need to be more willing to experiment, to take chances, and to um, look at things a different way than we've always looked at them. And I think that's hard, you know, for those of us of a certain age, I have to say, and I'm one of them, right, where it's hard for me to say, oh, maybe that's a better way to do things when I've been doing it a certain way my whole life. But, um, but it's often worth it, I think. So uh, I do think we need to be braver about that. So uh, for me, success is measured by the outcomes. Um, and I'll just mention a couple. For me, uh, there are a lot of things I would tolerate here in Santa Monica if every person who lived in Santa Monica was secure in their housing, was secure in their food, had access to a good education, had access to gainful and satisfying employment, and were able to spend time with their family and be mentally and physically healthy. I mean, it's it's as complicated as that, and it's as simple as that. And so, for example, one of the reasons that um, you know I supported Learn and Thrive being one of our strategic goals, and I think we focus a lot on the learn and not so much on the thrive sometimes. But for me, a successful Santa Monica is where everybody can thrive. And I think one of the ways to get there, and I think this is really important, and I'm just going to put it out there, is my guess is most of the people in this room, not all, I can't speak for all of you, don't face those challenges. Because you have the time to come out on a Saturday morning. You're not working three jobs trying to support a family. What we need to do as a relatively affluent community is recognize that easily 25% of our community is not, does not have the same opportunities that a lot of people in this room do, and be empathetic towards that, and realize that a lot of the decisions that we as policymakers, that our department heads and our staff are making, again, going back to that big picture, is recognizing that every decision we make has to be about making sure that the community, which is composed of residents and individuals, thrives. And sometimes that means not doing pet projects amongst ourselves or whatever, because resources need to be spent making sure that we provide the most basic services and can meet the most basic needs of people in our community. But as ambiguous as it sounds, if we were in a community where everyone had the maximal opportunity to thrive, I would count that as success. Well, social success for me is not defined merely by outcomes. I mean, you might get the best outcome with the benevolent dictatorship. Uh, to me, success is going to be defined by a good outcome that arises out of good process and are developing tools that will enable 
the three teams that you identified, the fourth team I suggested, the residents, and other teams, the business community is not here, for instance, all to work together cooperatively to identify shared values, to come up with programs and uh, processes that will achieve those good outcomes based on those shared values, and to do so based on accurate, uh, universally accepted facts to work from facts, not from opinions. Opinions are hugely useful until you get into making a decision and then you, you're at loggerheads because you're not gonna change somebody's opinion. But even if my opinion is that your idea is not the best way to do it, <coughs> if it turns out our values are coherent and we can agree that there's a way to do this that isn't my best idea but it's your best idea and it gets to somewhere we both want to go, I'll certainly learn to accept that. So, but it, it requires us all to have a better understanding of the realities of this city. And right now, there's a lot of misinformation being circulated about what the city is, what it does, uh, things as, as simple as what various statistics are. Again, we have a role, we have a communications department, we have a local press that does its best, but we, we you know, we are in the shadow of the LA Metroplex, so we're not gonna get a lot of TV time or LA time space. So people are gonna to have to work on finding out what are the realities of Santa Monica? What is this community you're a part of? Do you love this community as much as I do, as you probably do? Are you willing to work to make it a better place? If we can build a process based on that, I think we'll succeed despite ourselves. Yeah, and as you both know, we hear that the outcomes of, uh, to thrive. Yeah. To thrive is, is that goal. That, We've talked about that framework of well-being. <clears throat> and we look to those goals and values, and then we have to recognize that as we get there, we're not all going to agree on each decision made to get there. We're going to disagree among ourselves. We're going to disagree with some of you. you know, some of you think A, others think B. Some might actually think L. Uh, so we have to be able to recognize and keep in mind what are those big goals, what's the path there, and that there are going to be points where we just, me and Terry disagree, or I disagree with Gleam, I disagree with Ted, I disagree with Sue, I disagree with Tony, I disagree with Kevin, and other times when, you know, we'll have a different mix, and same with you. So that, that point being, we have to get over that, that if you don't agree with someone on a decision or a set of decisions, that they're no longer your neighbor. You're still your neighbor, they're still part of the community, and we need to keep dialogues going. And we need to remember to always be inclusive. Yeah, you know, I, I want to go back to some of the points that, that Kevin raised earlier. And the one that hits me, I agree with pretty much what you're saying, and I think the one of the key things is the process. And I always thought, uh, even going back to the early days, <coughs> that given our size of our city, the complexity of this community, that we all should have had, way back when, at least a staff person for each council member. Many cities our size, and smaller, have that. And I know some of my colleagues don't agree with this, but you know I'm listening to the conversation here, and it's all about communication, and in many cases, most of us, because we have to earn a living, don't have the time to do a lot of communicating with a lot of folks, especially neighborhood groups, on all of the issues that come before us. And I always thought that if you had a staff person that basically represents you, it gives you another, basically uh, gives you another person to kind of stretch your time and have that communication with those folks on whether it's an issue or, or a policy that you want to uh, explore with the community and get feedback from residents. And, and I think, you know, moving forward, I, I think we should seriously think about it because when I think about success moving forward, I don't think we're going to be more successful if we don't have the support, at least as elected officials. Yes, well, I'm, um, yeah, and I don't know if we're supposed to debate that or not, but I do <laughs> want to say something because I left it out of my previous statement, which was there is sort of a baseline that we all think we're from. And that baseline is obviously a community where people feel safe. And I will say back when I was uh, look, deciding where to live, one of the reasons I came to Santa Monica 
was because it had its own police department, it's had its own fire department. It was not the city of LA, where I'm sure we all have neighbors who live in the city of LA who've heard horror stories about emergency responses and things like that. So I do think that obviously a successful city at a very foundational level has to be a safe city. And I think that we build upon that because you can't thrive if you're not safe. So on that note, and thank you for taking that lead on that, over there on the framework, we have safety as a sub under community. So the question becomes, is public safety a seventh area that should be carved out over there on the framework? And I would raise that question to this group here. Well, I think it should be. I think that we all admit we've seen uh, an unfortunate uptick in crime. It's, it's regional, by the way. It's not unique to Santa Monica. It's not something we as a city are doing, but it's uh, far beyond Santa Monica city limits. But I think that clearly public safety is a concern among our residents, and I think we need to signal to them that we hear them, and that raising it to be part of that, a separate part of that framework would be a good idea. How about, how about just a show of hands? Yeah. Yeah, yeah show of hands, maybe. Yeah. Okay. I mentioned this earlier, and I know that we have the leadership of our police and fire departments here, and I've also been contacted by the rank and file, the workers in both police and fire, who are supportive of our adding this. Now, you know, three and a half, two and a half years ago when we had our summer retreat and we set the priorities we now have, at that time, uh, crime was at an all-time low or close to all-time low. It just wasn't the priority it has been at other points in the city's past and maybe at other points in the city's future. We also are fe facing uh, a period in the fire department where most of our fire department work is actually paramedic work. Our, our work at suppressing fires has been made much easier by our success at preventing fires. Um, I think public safety is has now in this last year particularly risen to a much higher level of public concern than it has been in a long time. I still feel we are a relatively safe city, but there have been things happening that are causing people to worry and should be. Well, I and saw seven uh, hands at a seven thirty right? well, that's all. Well, yep, so, check. So, but I have a question about that. Whether we're directing that or actually voting on it is up to the city attorney's decision on whether we have yeah, here a uh, just meeting where we can take that kind of action. Expressing opinions is fine. We, I do want to note that uh, the agenda specifically talks about a recommended action related to the framework. So this is the area where I am most comfortable. I'll make a motion. Second. But, but may I ask a question? I thought that we were talking about adding it to our five priorities and not to the framework. No, the framework. The framework. That's on the agenda. Okay, but, but then when we add it to the framework, is it clear that it integrates across all of the silos? That's my yes. question. Yes. Okay, thank from, you. From, I, I'm giving silo. you a, a consultant's view, but it, <laughs> it, it, it's a framework. Again, these are all interrelated pieces. Right. Um, it, it just elevates it to a different level is the way I'm understanding what you're trying to do. Okay. So, so we have just a motion returning on the to the floor I to we add voted public in. safety to the <coughs> framework that's up there, <coughs> you know, videos, report, et cetera. We have a second, so I think we can do this by voice vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? There you go. There we go. Just like the <laughs> And so, returning to the oh, go ahead, go ahead. Returning to this notion of what a success looked like, though, I want to make the point that I think partly the reason we're all here today is that um, we have an expectation among us as a community um, that it bears making explicit. I think the conversation today is intended to elicit some shared values um, and to express what we think a positive future will look like. Uh, reflecting those values and to ask ourselves how do we organize and take action to get there but I don't think we'll be happy unless we get there first right we are a city that expects leadership on our values and so figuring out how to get there first is really critical and um, not looking to peers, I'll tell you, I'll feel frustrated and this related to this question of what does success look like. I'll feel frustrated if I see other cities leading and getting to that vision of a, sh of a future that's based on the values we express together and they get there first. 
you know, if they're carbon neutral first, if they're meeting the Gleams list of um, satisfying all the needs for our residents and, and, and people who work here to participate in this economy. Those kinds of questions, if they're getting there first, I think we'll all sort of feel like we weren't doing our job as well as we could. So uh, for me, measuring success, you know, we, we've engaged on a lot of topics today and leading up to this meeting. And I think in many ways, we're headed in that direction already in terms of the Samostat metrics and things like that. Things that are easy to measure while they may be hard to attain. I agree with a lot of what my colleagues say about how we measure success. but when. When I look at some of the stuff that's in our staff report about 21st century governments, you know, data driven, well, we're going to do more of that. That's, you know, measurable. You can proceed to the deliberate rate, et cetera. Uh, we can have an evolving structure. The city manager is doing that with the total workplace we're implementing, et cetera. But when I look up there, the one that jumps out to me that is going to be the hardest to achieve and the hardest to measure, but I think will be the real side of success is that idea of community and the things that are in here about. Uh, government engages community in barn raising, and we have an ongoing relationship with community members. So those are, that's been a lot of what we've talked about today, is how we can better engage the city with its residents and its other constituent groups. And to me, that's a harder thing to measure and a harder thing to attain. But if we got to the point where at least felt like we were all in this together and talking to each other in a civil and respectful manner and understanding when decisions are made, it doesn't go your way, well, there's a reason for that. I, if we could get to that point, I think that would be an enormous success. And, and, well, and well, the goal may be to talk to each other in a civil way. Every once in a while, somebody might be talking to somebody being a huff, you know, we're, we're all humans. And the thing is that then you got to say, OK, you know, that, you know, I, I was angry with Terry. And, I walked away from him that day, but I have to be able to, you know, the next day say, oh, okay, you know, I was like, you know, all wound up, and to talk to him the next day. So I think we all need to recognize that if somebody might get annoyed with you, that you have to give them a little room, a little space, um, just as you would hope that they would give you a little room and a little space if, if you had a day where you were a little cranky or, or annoyed. So I think, again, that's leading to we need to always have some tolerance and is how we treat people, um, recognizing that somebody could have a bad day, even and be a little disrespectful, but not hold that against anybody. Well, I, I'm not talking about individual. No, I know, exchange. but I think that's I'm part of it. About Ted. our ability to communicate to the community a broader vision for where the city is headed that they want to be involved in and can mm -hmm. participate in, and and so we're all so we're all pulling on the oars in the boat in the same. Rhythm. Yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. to me would be a real success. There'll always be dissent, but if there was a broad consensus out there and a broad understanding of why things are going on. Well, and and actually, this goes to that that issue. And I think one of the things we don't do a good job at, or we could do a better job at, and, and I'll just use the example of something like a road diet. There's a tendency for government to say, let's put whatever street it is on a road diet. And we do it, and then people go, wait a minute, you took away my lane of traffic, or now I have to turn around cyclists. And maybe what we need to do is, before we take that action, talk about people, is reducing traffic accidents one of your values? Is saving lives one of your values? So now how are we going to do that? And let's have a public conversation about how we do that. And let's be, educate ourselves as a community about the strategies we have to do. And I'm looking at David. I'm sorry. I'm just picking something that I know. I mean, for example, on Ocean Park Boulevard, we continue to get feedback that you took it down to one lane and now it's more traffic-y. Yes, but there are 60% fewer accidents on Ocean Park Boulevard than there were before. Lives have been saved because we went down to one lane of traffic. But instead of creating the education and the knowledge base that says, oh, I understand why you want to do that and why this is a strategy to accomplish what Kevin talks about, our shared values, we sometimes have a chance, sometimes we have a tendency to, oh, that's a great idea, let's do it, without getting the community buy-in before we do it. And, and I'm not picking on Ocean Park Boulevard or, or any other particular project, but it just seems to me that sometimes if we tell people, here's the problem, help us solve it, rather than say, we have a solution. Oh, now let us explain to you why we thought that was the best solution. Does that make sense? That I think we, we might get more community buy-in to what Ted is talking about. So I think one of the great programs we've had is 
Fred's bike, uh, Fred, Ted's bike with a man. I don't know if it's Fred. Fred couldn't make it, so I came. <laughs> His Ted's bike with a mayor program. And, and um, I, I do think that those of us on the council could be more participatory in things like that so that people actually feel like we're talking to them and hearing them and, and Fred can tell us better <laughs> whether, uh, I Whether. can tell you this Thursday we have a bike ride with the mayor starting at 5.30 p.m. And, and I love the pub crawl part, right? I'll do the and pub crawl. Okay. <laughs> and, if, and if you can't bike ride with the mayor, we'll be at happy hour at Curious Palette. Yeah, okay? Right. So there you go. So, no, but I do think that all of us can do different things to outreach based on our own separate, you know, uh, uh, other stuff we do. I mean, Ted's a biker. I'm more comfortable on two feet. So uh, maybe... I could walk, but um, uh, anyway, I think that uh, maybe we all need to do more of that other than you know what we're doing. So the time is now 11.56, and I think I'm looking at Rick Cole, the city manager, to see if he wants to make a couple of comments, and then I was going to turn it over to the mayor because I'm pretty uh, set on being on time. That's kind of the way I operate. Um, yes? Can no? I ask you just one question? Sure. This is valuable information. Yes. How will we see it back? Uh, how you're going to see it back is it will, it's going to go back to my office. Uh, I have professionals there in the office that do one of these a week. Um, they take it, they'll input it by section and uh, graphically clean it up a little bit. Uh, and then you'll get it back as a report with all of the information. And the council and department heads will be mixed together, the inputs, because I didn't ask you to separate those. And then the public will be a grouping. It'll have the P on it for each one, so you'll be able to see how the public's feeling versus internally how it's being viewed. Is how it's been. And it'll take probably a couple of weeks by the time they get it finished, by the time they input it, proof it, and then send it to you in a report. And that's the Thank public you. who participated today. Oh, um, I'm going to send it to the yeah. city manager's office, and then the city manager's office. Oh, the input's the input, what's yeah. on the paper, yes. Right, and yes. that's representative of the public who participated today. In here in the room. Not yes. the general public. Correct. I, mean, I think we need to always Correct. keep recognizing that yeah. while it's great everybody who took their time to come here today, there are some people who might have liked to, but they couldn't. And Thank you. They're not representative. Rick, anything to say? I would only say that after 37 years of public service, these are hard jobs. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean not just the jobs of council member and staff members, but the job of being a citizen. Um, what do you call them, a resident, a community member, uh, a neighbor, what have you. Those are hard jobs. Um, and. Um, I'm, I'm really proud to be in a community that takes that job as seriously as we do here in Santa Monica. I've spent 37 years working on something I could put into seven words. Make government work better <coughs> and cost less. Um, I think that's the challenge for 21st century government is how do we make a government that works very well work better and a government that's pretty expensive, costs less. Um, not by diminishing the quality, but by improving the productivity. I think we can do that, and I think the, the today has been about the how. Most of the time, you are focused on the what. Most of the time, we're focused on the what. But um, every once in a while, I have to sharpen um, the knife to make sure it cuts, or sharpen the saw to make sure it saws. And that's what this is about, is Let's sharpen our ability to work together as a team, residents, elected officials, and those of us who work for all of you. Mayor? Well, I, I want to thank everybody who came out here, especially members of the public. I want to thank Rick and the manager's office for putting this together. Uh, I think it was actually very useful, and it's good to take a pause from sort of the slogging from council meeting to council meeting and, okay, what's on the radar two weeks from now? What's on the radar four weeks from now? When are we getting to this item? No, not till July. To take a step back and look at their longer-term goals. Um, I appreciate the members of the public being here. Having an involved citizenry is important to democracy. 
I don't know how many of you made it out yesterday to see the student citizens in front of City Hall using exercising their First Amendment rights to uh, express their concerns about how the Second Amendment is interpreted and enforced and applied in our country. But that made me very optimistic about the future of democracy in this city and in this country. And so on that note, I think we will close this meeting. And those of us who, those of you who want to talk to individual council members, some of us will stick around and have a dialogue. Ma with you. Mayor, you, you know I've used the fist of five just so we go out of here with some sense of how people feel. Could, could we do that? You know how that works. You know how it works, Mark. <laughs> Is that a kung fu thing? <laughs> 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 On a scale of one to five, one being uh, you're sorry you, you spent three hours here when you could have uh, been somewhere else, and five being that that uh, imperfect as, as democracy is, uh, this was a great opportunity for us to, to work together on democracy. A three being somewhere in the middle. Let, let me ask the council your view of how, how this went today on a one to five scale. One being uh, below your expectations, five being maybe above your expectations. <coughs> Fives and fours? Fours and fives. About the... Uh, You're losing a point for me for having a nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not, not the staff that are in the, in the audience here, but just the, the residents who come out here today. What, how, how do you feel like how you spent your time today? All right. And then how about, uh, how about our staff members? Oh, I was just going to say, come on. Before they go to sleep. Oh, All right. Well, thank you very much. Mayor? <laughs> All right. We are officially adjourned. <laughs>